Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Edwards with the Grand River Dam Authority, and welcome to our updated study report meeting. We're going to be reporting out the final season of studies over the next two days. And as we do that, I have a couple of housekeeping items uh, for us. The meeting is being recorded. Uh, please mute your lines. We, we have just tons of material to present today. So we're going to pause for questions and answers at appropriate times through each uh, presentation. Uh, during the Q&A sessions, if you would, use the raise your hand feature to indicate you have questions. If audio issues exist, and I know we're working through some uh, right now, uh, use the chat feature. Uh, participant discussion and dialogue are encouraged during the question and answer sessions. We are planning on lunch from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. And if a study session finishes early, we will proceed to the next item. So the purpose of today's meeting is to describe GRDA's progress in implementing its relicensing plan uh, per FERC's February 24, 2022 determination on requests for study plan modifications and new studies along with FERC's May 27, 2022 determination for requests on modifications for the sedimentation study. Results for each study during the final study season will be presented today and tomorrow. GRDA will file a meeting summary with FERC by October the 30th of 2022. This meeting summary will include only the meeting agenda and presentations. All stakeholders' comments uh, must be submitted in writing, and the deadline for filing all of those written comments is November the 29th of 2022. This is the uh, remaining part of the schedule. We are in the highlighted portion of this. Uh, we, have, we are required to have this meeting before October the 15th, 2022. Then we'll move on to file our summaries that I just mentioned and summary disagreements by November the 29th. Then we'll file responses by December the 29th, and then we will file our draft license application January the 1st of 2023. The commission will have until the 28th for resolution of disagreements. And then comments on the draft license application will be due on April the 1st of 2023 for us to file our final license application at the end of May 31st of 2023. Any questions? No. All right, so before we begin, I have a few comments I'd like to make on the, uh, you know, as we begin the study part on the H&H &H modeling, I'd like to just talk a little bit about history and context. The development of a useful and comprehensive hydraulic and hydrological model for the Pensacola project has been a very intensive effort. It really dates back to the 2014 2015 timeframe when both GRDA and Tetra Tech uh, started model development. Since that time, we've all invested heavily in this effort, and we, and we all share a common interest of trying to learn what happens during high flow events in the watershed. So as the process formally began, GRDA chose to adopt the city of Miami's Tetratech model as a foundation for our work in this area. We did this uh, not only to recognize the strong work that they did, but also in a spirit of cooperation, and because this is just a highly technical undertaking for everybody involved. So now we have spent seven years improving and building the model and we collected just tons of data to make it more reliable and accurate. And we've got lots of comments. As you all know, almost everybody here has been on the meetings through the process and there has just been tons of comments that have been very helpful and very constructive throughout this process. And we were glad that everybody had the opportunity to do that. So together, these comments have been instrumental in uh, developing a set of predictive tools. And I think we can all be satisfied and confident that we have a clear understanding of the flows through the watershed. 
And after all this work, <clears throat> through all the uh, FERC required study plans, GRDA's dam operations have come to a really compelling conclusion that they don't affect upstream water levels. The H&H &H investigation, the sedimentation modeling, uh, and even the support of geomorphology uh, all indicate that the main effect of upstream flooding is a product of nature. And this has occurred long before the construction of the Pensacola Dam. So as we continue on through the day, you know, we want to have a robust technical discussion on the information that's presented. We have followed the FERC study plan. Everybody's going to have an opportunity today to see that we have complied with that. But I would like to leave with this, with this thought. GRDA is very sympathetic to the city of Miami and the challenges they have with flooding. We understand the struggle, struggle, but all the evidence supports that GRDA does not have an material effect on the water levels in Miami. So with that, Jesse. Brian, I'm gonna take a few minutes and try to resolve this all technical right. issue. Give me just a minute, everyone. Well, let's do this. All right, it's Jacqueline again. I'm having issues responding as the host to uh, the Q&A. So IT is working on that. Um, I'm also working behind the scenes on those of you that are having trouble joining. Uh, 
So just bear with me just a couple of more minutes. Can you guys verify in the chat as attendees, just a few of you, that you're able to hear us? It's not and say It's the Q&A. It's not the chat. It's the Q&A session, not the chat. You can just verify that you're hearing us okay? Okay. Thank you, Walker. I'm hesitant to get started until everyone's able to join. Like, I don't want to... Give me a few more minutes. All right, I think we've resolved the Q&A issues. I'm still working on getting a couple of people in, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jesse uh, with me and for the h, h Thank you, Jacqueline, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'll be talking with you very briefly to introduce the hydrologic and hydraulic modeling study. Uh, then you'll hear from Ryan Greif regarding the operations model. So... First, I would like to discuss the H&H &H study objectives um, and also start to get everyone familiar with some of the terminology we'll be using today. So I will discuss the updated study report, which you'll often see abbreviated as USR in our slide decks today. I'll touch briefly on vertical datums. Um, it's a technical issue, but it's quite important for the work that is proceeding. Um, then Ryan, as I said, will come up and discuss the operations model, uh, also known as the OM or OPS model. I'll be back to discuss the upstream hydraulic model or UHM, and then Nick will be discussing the downstream hydraulic model or DHM. So the objectives of the H&H &H study. 
our objectives, and this comes from uh, the revised study plan and FERC's approved um, study plan determination, were to analyze inundation under current license operations of the project during several measured inflow events, provide model results in a format that can inform other analyses, and determine feasibility of implementing anticipated future operations that may be proposed by GRD as part of the relicensing effort. So I've introduced those components of the model. Let me show you how they work together to meet those objectives. Uh, as you can see with the graphic on uh, your screens there, we have the operations model, which feeds into the I've muted you. I don't know why it's. Testing, testing. All right. Apologies, everyone. Um, so we have the operations model that feeds into the upstream hydraulic model, or UHM, and also into the downstream hydraulic model, or DHM. The operations model also feeds data directly into other studies. And uh, finally, um, the UHM and DHM also feed data as needed into other studies. Also, the UHM and DHM together form the CHM, or Comprehensive Hydraulic Model. So we'll be using that terminology a lot today. Next, I'll talk about the updated study report, or USR activities. So, broadly speaking, our, our tests were to update the OM, the UHM, and the DHM based on FERC's discussion and staff recommendations. Once again, I have a note there that together the UHM and the DHM form the CHM. And secondly, I also want to mention that FERC or the Commission's discussion and staff recommendation will be discussed during the upcoming presentations. So we're going to discuss those discussion and staff recommendations as they apply to each of those modeling efforts. Uh, also, we have run anticipated operations for the upstream and downstream models. And finally, provide lentic and lodic maps for baseline and anticipated operations as needed for the aquatic species of concern, the terrestrial species of concern, and the wetlands and riparian habitat studies. Next, again, technical detail, but I'll briefly discuss vertical datums. On your screens, you'll see this graphic relating the various vertical datums um, that can be used in this geographic area to each other. Most commonly used is PD, that stands for Pensacola Datum. And if we do not say otherwise today, we are referring to elevations in PD. So if you hear us say 742 or 745, that is in Pensacola Datum or PD. The difference between PD and NGVD-29 is 1.07 feet, with NGVD-29 being higher than PD datum. You also see the conversion there with NAVD-88, uh, which is a datum that can be used in this geographical area, but is not used in our study. And with that, I will um, ask for questions. Jacqueline? I think that Walker had a couple of questions on just the USR report itself, Jesse, not just, not, not any particular study. So um, this is probably the best time to address those questions, even though we're within the context of the H&H. &H. Sure. So Jacqueline, can you unmute Walker and... Walker. 
Walker, you should be unmuted now. Do you want to test your audio? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks for squeezing me in. I, I realize it's an awkward point in the conversation. Um, I'm sorry, I'm hearing myself in my headset. I'm going to switch to my computer audio. One moment. Are you unmuted, Walker? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you for bearing with me. So, yeah, two questions of uh, just clarification and a actual question related to the discussion of the National Defense Authorization Act and the USR report, um, both on page 11. And so, um, first, DRDA says, Orally for permission from imposing any license obligation out of the boundary as of, as of Congress enactment of NDAA 2020. Walker, wanna... we're having trouble. We're having trouble hearing you. You're cutting out really bad. Uh, sorry. Um... That's okay. Uh, you have a connection. Better? It's just. Yeah, it's just... yeah. I tried to switch one setting. Can you hear me any better? Maybe. Maybe just a little bit. So, um, uh, what I'm asking about is the statement about the NDAA provision related to the project boundary. And there's the statement that says the NDAA statutorily prohibits the commission from imposing any license obligation outside of the project boundary as it existed as of Congress enactment of NDAA 2020. And I just wanted to clarify whether that was uh, expressing GRDA's understanding of how that provision works in relicensing, uh, or that is, is GRDA saying that the project boundary under the new license must be the same as under the old license, or is that a statement that uh, 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 ongoing disputes under the existing license? Well, I, um, Walker, I think it's our position that the NDAA was enacted in 2019 and Congress was making a decision based on the commission's authority starting at that particular time. But that's, you know, that's a legal argument. Um, and certainly, you know, and I'm sure you'd agree that the USR meeting isn't really a time to try to resolve legal disputes. Well, no, and I'm not trying to resolve it and I'm not going to, you know, advance a position, but I am since you put it in your USR, I'm trying to understand what's being, you know, asserted. That's all. Uh, and I haven't, I don't think I heard a clarification of what you just said. And if you don't clarify, we can live with that. But I wanted to take a chance to. Oh, I, I think I did clarify. I, I think that, you know, our view is that Congress acted as of a certain date. Uh, Congress did not. Uh, put any sort of future or, or uh, past limitation on uh, that, that part of NDA or really any part of it. So my, my view, uh, GRDA's view, is that that uh, provision became immediately applicable at the time that the, the law was enacted. I don't think I heard, but 
I'm I'm not perceiving a clear answer to the question I thought I asked. We can move on. Okay. Um, well, why don't you ask your question again, and I'll try to okay. be more clear. Sure. So I'm trying to understand whether GRDA's position is that the project boundary under the new license must be the same as the project boundary under existing. Um, I would say to, to answer that question, uh, you have to, the answer is not necessarily. Uh, the you know, Congress made it clear in NDAA that the commission can't make any changes to the project boundary except if GRDA um, uh, agrees to the change. So I would say if uh, the commission and GRDA agree to changes in the project boundary uh, as part of the relicensing effort. The boundary does not need to be the same as it is today. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think I think that's helpful. Um, I, I don't think we need to, to spend any more time on it today. Um, but thank you for that. Um, and, and I do realize it's, you know, it's not sort of the sort of issue that usually comes up. With me, so I do appreciate it. Um, the other one is in a statement of paragraph or two later. Uh, and this is just purely factual where GRDA talks about the 1946 uh, legislation that specified that the federal government would retain the interest in lands necessary for operation of the pool at 750 and above. And I just wanted to confirm my understanding um, based on like GRDA's encroachment report. My understanding is that GRDA today holds all those interest in lands um, under the, the Win Act of 2016 and its implementation. Is, the, is my understanding correct on that? Uh, yeah, I think, Walker, the reason we make that point is to demonstrate that. Uh, since the very beginning of this project, from the time that it was conceived, uh, even through the, the last relicensing in, in the 1990s, that uh, Congress, uh, the Federal Power Commission, FERC, GRDA, the Department of the Interior, the, Co the Corps of Engineers, all agencies that have been involved in, at this project for a long, long time, have always uh, acted in a way that establishes the FERC jurisdictional project um, as uh, ending at 750 feet elevation. Uh, and again, the, the, the 1946 law is just one of many instances in which this has been established, going back to the uh, original 1939 license uh, a statute that was enacted by Congress in 1940, uh, the 1946 uh, legislation that you mentioned. There are some, some other legislative enactments. Um, uh, and then, of course, the, the NDAA in 2019. And together with that, you have the different FERC uh, licensing orders as well. It is true that, that uh, Congress uh, did direct the, uh, the transfer of some of the easements from the core to GRDA, but, it did, but that enactment did not change the, the jurisdictional uh, division uh, between uh, GRDA as the licensee and uh, responsible for land 750 and below, and the uh, responsibilities of the Corps of Engineers um, uh, in, in the flood pool that rises above that. Um, and of course, the, the WIN Act that you uh, identified uh, came before the NDAA in 2019. Um, and the, the NDAA in 2019 leaves no doubt in GRDA's view as to where the commission has jurisdiction and where the core has jurisdiction. The whole point of that legislation, as I would hope we could agree, was to resolve that issue, the, the jurisdictional issue once and for all. I hope that answers your question. Well, I, you know, I was trying to avoid legal argument and just purely confirm factually my understanding that 
today, GRDA holds all of those rights formerly held by the Corps above 750. Do we have all of the rights now? Those rights have been have been um, transferred to GRDA uh, under the Act, Walker. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just making sure I understood. All right, that's all I had. Okay, thank you very much. We'll switch uh, to the PowerPoint for Jesse and get him back on. Or Ryan, I'm sorry. presenting GRDA's operations model to you this morning. Quick outline of the presentation. I'll discuss the FERC February 22 determination letter, the operations model objectives, go over the final study season improvements, talk about the sensitivity analysis to the stage storage table update, discuss the validation against historical USGS gauge data, and then go through all the computed scenarios uh, that were completed for the operations model. In February this year, FERC issued a determination letter which provided clarification on what GRDA needed to do during this final study season. Uh, three things were recommended specifically for the operations model. First, to run the operations model for all the implements with starting elevations ranging from 734 to 757 feet Pensacola data. Secondly, to compare water surface elevations at the USGS gauge upstream of the dam to the computed operations model stages for the December 2015 and October 2009 inflow events. Thirdly, to compare or to look at the sensitivity of updating the model to the 2019 stage storage information, which was um, based on the survey collected by USGS. And then lastly, the letter also acknowledged the planned improvements to the operations model, which were proposed by GRDA in the ISR. So GRDA has completed um, these recommendations from the first determination. Uh, we first completed the plan improvements that were discussed in the ISR, and this was done to achieve more consistent matching of the operations model results to the flood routing model or riverware model results. We compared the water surface elevations at the USGS gauge upstream of the dam to the computed operations model stages for those two historical inflow events recommended by FERC staff. We analyzed the sensitivity to updating the model using the 2019 stage storage information. And then we ran the operations model for all the inflow events with starting elevations between 734 and 757. GRDA then moved on to simulate several sets of operations model cases in support of the comprehensive hydraulic model, which includes the upstream and downstream hydraulic models, which will be presented later today, as well as the sedimentation study and other relicensing studies. GRDA held a technical conference in April specifically to discuss the operations model, and this provided an opportunity to answer relicensing participants' questions specifically about the operations model. Um, gave us a chance to discuss the improvements that were planned to the model coming out of the ISR. And we had complete at that time the historical USGS page data validation cases that were requested in the February letter. So we also presented those results at that time. The overall objectives of the operations model include things that were completed during the first study season, which I will briefly mention here, but these are not the subject of today's presentation. These have already been ruled on in for its determination. And then the activities completed during the final study season. So during the first study season, GRDA validated the operations model results with the Army Corps of Engineers River model data and synthesized hypothetical events to inform and set boundary conditions of the comprehensive hydraulic model. In this final study season, GRDA performed sensitivity analysis for updating the stage storage table in the model, 
validated the results against the USGS gauge data for the October 2009 and December 2015 inflow events, added scenarios, combining the initial, the initial reservoir levels and flow events, and then moved on to compare future versus existing bathymetry and anticipated versus baseline operations. And I'll discuss that in more detail further down in the presentation. Uh, and then finally, use the operations model to calculate the effects of anticipated operations on seasonal water levels in support of the other relicensing studies. Just a note, I will take questions at the end of my presentation. It's not very long, so uh, unless there's anything urgent that, that uh, comes up, we'll just keep rolling through here. So going through the final study season activities. First, GRDA made the plan improvements to the operations model that were identified in the ISR. And again, this was in order to achieve better matching, especially of peak stages between the operations model results and the flood routing model results. So recall that the flood routing model is based on the flood routing logic and rules in the Riverwood model that was developed by the Army Corps of Engineers for this entire basin. And the flood routing model pairs that down to this subsystem and routes the floods. And then the operations model picks up those results and uses them along with the actual detailed hydropower operations simulation to predict how the project would operate. So we noticed in the first study season that some of the peaks weren't quite matching up. And these were the improvements that we made in order to correct that. Uh, so first, we added some logical checks so that the allowable falling release change uh, does not overdraw the reservoir below the target elevation. This primarily affected things after the peak of the event. Um, secondly, we also allowed the operations model to adjust spillway discharge on an hourly basis to compensate whenever scheduled power is bought back on the real-time market because of market price drops. So this just allowed more consistent matching of the total outflow predicted by the flood routing model. Um, these changes um, improve the uh, matching of the operations model flow routing to the flood routing model results in addition uh, to the stage matching. So there is some logic put in uh, based on the transition from normal operations into spillway operations so that the operations model would seek to match both the total outflow and the peak stage from the flood routing model more smoothly. And then also uh, the model was updated to use the 2019 US just bathymetry data after we, we also looked at a sensitivity analysis, which I'll talk about. Uh, so these changes did result in better peak stage ma matching um, throughout the model. Um, so it was a successful outcome. We did analyze the sensitivity to updating the model to use the 2019 stage storage data. Um, initially, during the first study season, the operations model relied on the Riverware model stage storage table. And after we updated to the 2019 data, we compared uh, for the entire period of record of the operations model, which is 2004 through 2019. And then we also looked at specific inflow events that we're using during the study um, that, that occurred during that uh, period of record. And so for the entire period of record simulation, we look at you know, the, the mean, the median, the min, and the max water surface elevations that occurred, and they were all uh, matching very closely within 0 0.01 feet. And then looking at the individual events, um, we had you know, different results, but they all came in within two tenths of a foot or less. Um, and this is just a graph to show that October 2009 event that had a difference of point one seven feet, just to kind of put that in context of the entire event. Um, so this, this is showing two different lines, one using the Riverwear model stage storage table and one using the updated 2019 USGS stage storage. So you can see just how closely they match here. And that's just for that, that one event that had the largest difference in peak elevations. So with those results, we, we decided to move ahead with the 2019 stage storage information based on um, the sensitivity analysis. We did compare the operations model results against historical USGS gauge data for the two events uh, recommended by FERC staff. This was USGS gauge number listed there on the screen. And we had inflow hydrographs that we back calculated using records of the reservoir elevation, 
total discharge and the stage storage table from the 2019 survey. And um, so that, that allowed us to get the total inflow to the reservoir to run these simulations. We also used the historical spillway gate openings in order to calculate uh, the actual historical spillway discharge, which is a key component of the flood routing. And then the operations model uh, with all of its you know, logic and um, rules was used to simulate uh, the hydropower operations on top of this data. Uh, so we simulated these two events and graphically compared uh, the results of the operations model against the USGS gauge data. Again, this was presented at the technical conference. Uh, you can see those results here. Uh, and obviously, the stages match very closely. So this demonstrates the operations model is able to faithfully recreate the observed stages during that event, uh, given the accurate inputs of inflow and spillway gate openings. So during this last segment, I'm going to present all the simulations that were computed by the operations model in support of the other models and studies. So firstly, we, we ran a large suite of simulations using baseline operations. And that's a, a key term for today. Baseline operations refers to the seasonal midnight rule curve, which was in effect prior to the 2015 license amendment. So as you can see in the graph here, this is the rule curve that extended from elevation 741 up to elevation 744 and varied seasonally. These uh, model simulations were done using the same six inflow events from the ISR which included approximately one year to 100 year return period events. And based on the FERC recommendations, we expanded the initial reservoir elevations for those events to this range of 734 up to 757 feet PD. Um, and then also looked at the historical initial elevations based on uh, historical records at the start of each event. So because there's no initial um, historical elevation for the 100 year event, these six inflow events and the range of elevations resulted in 71 total scenarios, uh, which are shown combined on this table here. And you'll note that highlighted in the center of the elevations is this anticipated operational range. And this is GRDA's anticipated um, operating range where they would be normally uh, generating um, during uh, normal flows between 742 and 745. And then below that, extending down to 734, and above that, extending up to 757 is what we were calling the extreme hypothetical range. This is outside of GRDA's proposed action. Uh, this is not the normal range that we would consider for hydropower operations. But we did simulate all these events um, in order to analyze upstream and downstream water levels. Next, the anticipated operations were modeled. And the anticipated operations include a flexible power pool between elevation 742 and 745. The operations model schedules power generation based on the market price being above a certain threshold based on the standard deviation analysis. And there's a lot more information about that in our report. Um, but basically, GRDA can schedule power on the day ahead market or they can increase power on the real-time market. And the decision about whether to generate or not at a particular time is based on the market price compared to uh, standard deviations of trailing market prices. So that's just a way to, you know, to put the decision-making that happens into a computer model that can then be replicated uh, in a similar fashion against all these different events. So we simulated this new operation, the anticipated operations, under um, the period of record from 2004 through 2019. And that resulted in this average stage of 743.1. And that was calculated based on when the pool is below elevation 745. Um, so we know that when the pool is above 745 or forecast to go above 745, then the Army Corps um, is in control of operations. So that, that part was excluded in order to characterize what the normal pool elevation would be during normal operations. And that elevation of 743.1 then becomes the target elevation for the flood routing model so that the flood routing model can return the pool to that normal elevation following an inflow event. 
So the anticipated operations were compared to the baseline operations for the scenario shown in the table at the bottom, which included the full range of initial elevations and the full range of inflow event magnitudes. So we extend from elevation 734 to 757 and from the June 2004 event through the 100 year event. And then we also ran a simulation for the July 2007 event, which is in the middle and it's an event of historical importance to upstream communities. And so we thought it was important to include that. And the initial elevations used for that simulation are those that were computed for the period of record simulations using both sets of operations. So this is a really important and useful comparison because it's based on, you know, you're just going along, you're running with your baseline operations or your anticipated operations, and then you get, you know, kind of a normal uh, size inflow event, you know, what happens and how do you compare during those uh, types of conditions. So all of that information that I just discussed, the baseline operations, the anticipated operations, that'll be discussed in more detail later as it turns into uh, predicting water surface elevations. So for now, I'm going to move on to the other cases simulated by the operations model. So we also ran some simulations to support the sedimentation study. Um, so this was simulated across a, a license period of 50 years, so from 2020 through 2070, and that was based on historical data from 1970 through 2020 that was then randomized and reshuffled by year um, just to give you know, historically relevant inflows to the operations model. So these inflows were provided from the sediment transport model. Uh, we got the evaporation rates and downstream inflows for those same time periods from the riverware model. The turbine air valve operation, price factors, number of units online, all these things came from the operations model data. And because we didn't have hourly data before 2004, we used this uh, regular period of 2008 through 2020 um, which is just a convenient time frame of 12 years that we could then repeat uh, to fill out that 50 year simulation. So we used the hourly data that we did have and just replicated that uh, for the 50 year simulation. So those were all the inputs. And then um, the operations model was run in order to get the stage hydrographs at the dam uh, to feed back into the sediment transport model so that it had a downstream boundary condition based on the actual operations. The stage storage information was predicted by the sediment transport model for that 50 year simulation. And the stage storage data at the end of that 50 years was fed back into the operations model. So the operations model then had the existing stage storage table based on the 2019 survey and the predicted future stage storage table based on a certain set of operations. And then the operations model could interpolate between those two stage storage tables over that 50 year period. So we re-simulated the operations model and then fed those stage hydrographs again back into the sediment transport model based on you know, operating with a change in stage storage over time. And then the sediment transport model was again rerun using those downstream stage hydrographs to produce another stage storage table in the future, very similar to that first run. And then we compared that stage storage table based on that second iteration to confirm that it had converged, that the model was, you know, that we had fed the, the correct data through and we had converged on the solution for the future condition. So we did this to compare both the anticipated and the baseline operations to see how they would affect the stage storage data over 50 years differently. And we also looked at um, sensitivity to higher or lower sedimentation rates and the details of that sensitivity analysis will be presented later. So the summary table at the right shows the different cases that were analyzed. We looked at baseline versus anticipated operations for the accept, expected rate of sediment accumulation and then also the anticipated operations at higher and lower sediment rates. Another suite of simulations that was computed by the operations model was in support of the 1D UHM, which is distinct from the UHM and the STM, and, and we'll get into that all in more detail uh, later. Um, but this was done for again, anticipated versus baseline operations and also existing versus future storage. And you can see the table below summarizing all the model runs that were completed. We looked at the sensitivity to the sedimentation rate for the 
and this resulted in uh, 30 scenarios combining different initial elevations and inflow events. So we looked at the July 2007 and the 100 year event for elevations of 740, 745, and 750. So this gives us upstream water levels based on the existing and the future sedimentation conditions, both for anticipated and baseline operations, including sensitivity to sedimentation rate. Another set of scenarios that was computed uh, was done in support of other relicensing studies, including the aquatic species study, terrestrial species study, and the wetlands in riparian habitat study. And we also looked at this uh, from the lens of computed um, elevations for recreation or boating navigation. This was done for a period between November 1st, 2004 and November 1st, 2019, which was the, the full period of record that we had available where we could do an entire uh, year um, and ending at the same date on each end. The seasons that we analyzed were recommended by each of the individual study teams. So within each uh, resource area or each study, there were specific dates that were most critical. And so we looked at um, the effects on water levels during just those seasonal windows in support of each study. And what we produced uh, was an analysis of anticipated versus baseline operations. Again, using that, that 2019 USGS storage data. And then we produced median reservoir elevation and inflows broken down by season. And the inflows are just simply based on the historical record. Obviously the operations project can't control what comes in, uh, but it does affect the median reservoir elevations slightly. So that's, that's the main output there. And we also looked at percent of time uh, exceeding certain elevations within the seasons. And then we produced high flow event stage hydrographs in order to map the maximum inundation. So the next table summarizes the results of the operations model for all these cases in support of the other studies. And in, in the split cells toward the right, I'll just note that the values in the upper left corner of each cell represent the results from the baseline operations case. And the results in the lower right corner represent the anticipated operations. So just like it says on the right there, baseline on the left, anticipated on the right. So in summary, the operations model uh, was used to perform sensitivity analysis to updating, to use the USGS 2019 stage storage table. It was used to validate the results against the USGS gauge data for the October 2009 and December 2015 events. We added scenarios to combine initial reservoir levels across six different inflow events. We compared anticipated versus baseline operations as well as the future versus existing bathymetry and provided those results out to the other models to compute uh, additional results. And then we calculated the effects of the anticipated operations on seasonal water levels in support of these other studies. So with that, I will take any questions. Okay. Um, Walker, I saw that you had your hand up earlier, but now it's removed. Did you um, have any questions? Sorry, I had left it up from my earlier question. I think I will have a question or two, but not just yet. But I, I think Di probably has some as well. Yes, Thank I you. see Di has his hand raised. So let me um, great, great. unmute him and I'll get to this question. Okay, Di, I think you are unmuted. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Ryan. Uh, I do have a few questions. Um, some of them may be repeats from your earlier presentation, but I, I think it's worth uh, mentioning those again. Um, first of all, I think the most important one is your analysis of, of the um, Pensacola stage up stage for starting water surface elevations. And for example, I'm looking I know you haven't presented them here, but they are presented in the uh, upstream hydraulic model. Um, first of all, the, the one I'm looking at is on figure C9. It shows the July 2007 event. 
and you have a started specified starting water surface elevation. Uh, one of them is uh, 749, 753, and 757. Immediately after the simulation begins, the water surface elevation drops about four feet before the flood wave comes. So to me, this sort of negates the whole purpose of the starting water, having a high starting water surface elevation if you're going to immediately lower the pool reservation, pool elevation before the flood begins. Would you explain, you know, first of all, how this happens and, and whether you think it's consistent with what I was asking for? Certainly, yes. So I understand your question to me um, that the initial elevations start at, at higher pool levels than, than what CRDA is is anticipating to operate and at the start of the event we see those pool levels come down from those initial elevations um, before the event uh, peaks and passes and the reason for this is that we're simulating uh, again based on the Army Corps of Engineers riverware model um, how they would programmatically uh, route those inflow events through not only this reservoir but the entire system of reservoirs right all the way down to Van Buren so the Army Corps obviously is tasked with balancing um, the levels across that entire system, and they use this through an operating balance level approach. And so this simulates essentially what would happen if the reservoir began at an initial reservoir elevation specified, and then you had a flood event coming into the reservoir. You know what's what's going to happen realistically in that scenario is you're going to want to draw down that abnormally high elevation at the start of the event in order to balance the levels of the different reservoirs throughout the system. You know, that, you know, based on the riverware model logic, that is what we would expect to occur. And so the flood routing model is doing that same uh, sort of thing, trying to balance those operation levels as the event comes in. And so this more or less represents a, a modelable approach to how the Army Corps of Engineers would direct GRDA to operate during such an event. So two points there. Are you suggesting that the Corps of Engineers would direct them to pre-release flows before the flood comes? Is that what you're trying to simulate? Uh, what what we what we understand based on the operating logic from the riverware model is that if Pensacola began at these high elevations again above GRDA's anticipated operation range, um, the Army Corps of Engineers would be um, giving them direction, likely at that time, to draw down the pool in order to balance uh, the operating level of Pensacola with the other re reservoir levels in the system. Right. Well, the other point is this seems to all depend on when you start your simulation. For example, the July 2007 event, you start on June 28th. But if you'd started it closer towards the flood peak, which is more or less July 1, then it would maintain a high starting water surface elevation throughout it. I, I believe or, we're starting these events at the same time that we did during the ISR. Um, so this, this was all discussed last year, and I, I believe everybody's had a chance to review and comment, and, and FERC has made their determination. On that component. Well, so. We haven't because these this is the first time you've actually modeled these what you're calling, you know, the seven fifty seven and lower events. So this is our first chance to respond to, to these higher events. But you're questioning the timing of the event and those those event timings were already established at the ISR. Okay. So what happens if you maintain a high starting water? Did you do any simulations to maintain a high water surface elevation? until the peak of the flood arrived. That, I, I, don't, I don't see that as, as a realistic operation, and that's not anything that, uh, that FERC requested us to do. We did not simulate that. Okay. Well, I see it as valuable, and to me, it, it goes to the point of what FERC was asking. Um, I'll just move on from that question. Um, Dr. Thomas, uh, yes. 
This is Jesse Petrowski. I'll be uh, discussing the UHM later. But speaking directly to your question, when you are talking about initial water surface elevations where they are above 745 and the core would already be in control, that is not a pre-release. And the core would be in control. And the mathematical model shows, for example, if the water surface elevation at the dam, one moment. If the water surface elevation at the dam is 757, which is equal to the crest of the dam, there is going to be a release. And that has nothing to do with FERC's determination. So the characterization that we're not following for its determination or the spirit of the determination is completely unfair. Well, we'll address that one in comments. That um, good. The let's see. I had a I had a. Would you turn to? I think it's slide twenty one. Yeah, in the lower left corner there, it shows uh, the conditions. And, and first of all, I just want to confirm the anticipated operations is what uh, GRDA intend to request in the new license. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So you ran five, and the lower left shows five conditions, you, you, simulations. Um, mm -hmm. What's the explanation for not running all of those uh, conditions down there? Well, we, we ran all of the conditions for the baseline operations as recommended by FERC in order to characterize you know, the full range of um, upstream water levels. But it, when it comes down to actually analyzing the anticipated versus baseline operations, uh, you know, this, this provides a useful comparison spanning both the full range of inflow events, the full range of elevations, and as well as, like I say, this most useful comparison in the middle. Um, and, and we'll get into all that information and actually show you the results of those comparisons later. And I would say, you know, I would recommend you wait and actually see those comparisons because they're pretty compelling. And I think after you've seen those, you know, if you still want to discuss the scenarios that we ran, we'll report open to hearing that question at that time. Okay, and I just see uh, something caught my eye there. You've got July 2007. That's, you're referring to the four-year frequency for the total inflow to Grand Lake and not the, for example, not the flood frequency return for the Neosho River, which was likely closer to a 50-year old. Again, this was all discussed at the ISR. Um, so this is not new information, but the July 2007 event is is rated as approximately a four-year event based on the total inflow to the dam. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're going to recover some stuff from the previous one, just to be clear. Um, on page six of your report, um, it indicates the regulating discharges of 100,000 CFS established in the water control manual are considered for Pensacola Kerr and Fort Gibson. I realize under the uh, historic operations, they try and limit it to 100,000 uh, to prevent flooding downstream. In some floods, it exceeds that. And I think during the 2019 flood, it may have been closer to 150,000. Um, but how does, can you just tell me again how the operations model, does it limit it to 100,000? or does it allow it to go above 100,000 under, under large flood events? Thank you for the question. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a mixed approach. It combines different uh, rule sets across uh, the simulations. And it, what it's doing is it's trying to limit it to 100,000 CFS, uh, unless you get to a point um, where you can't limit that anymore um, without going out of your 
uh, your total balance levels. So there's kind of this, this hand in hand approach of trying to maintain a balance between the different reservoirs, um, as well as trying to limit it to 100,000 CFS. So if, if all the reservoirs are filling up too quickly and you can't um, you know, hold enough water uh, and uh, the other reservoirs, you know, if the reservoirs start to get out of balance, then, then you can go over 100,000 CFS, and it, and it will for the larger events. Okay, thanks. Um, and I know you you calibrated the you calibrated the model. You were had the known gate openings, um, say for the two thousand and seven flood, and you showed the calibration for that. But would you just repeat? How did you apply the gate openings for say higher starting water surface and lower starting water surface elevations? Did you assume the same gate openings, or how did you how did you account for so, uh, core of engineers direction in those floods? That was accounted for using the flood routing model again, based on the logic coming out of Riverware, which does not get into the granularity of the individual spillway gate openings because it does not need to. What it uses instead is a rating curve based on the possible upper limit of spillway discharge if all gates were fully open, and also the possible uh, minimum surcharge elevation if the gates were closed and were over top. So that, that information is all, again, from the Riverware model. And when we talked about using the spillway gate openings, that was only for those two historical calibration events. Uh, and that's based on the fact that you know, the flood routing model is predicting, based on standard rules, what would happen generally during you know, any given inflow event. But on the ground in practice, the Army Corps of Engineers is not solely relying on something like riverware to make those decisions. They're taking in additional information, making additional uh, judgments based on facts on the ground, and they're coming up with more specific um, flood routing uh, directives during those events. So in order to historically calibrate to that event, we need to know specifically what the Army Corps of Engineers directed GRDA to release. And that's why for those two historical calibration events, we have to look at those specific historical spill and gate openings. The flood routing model, again, is more useful for comparing different scenarios and saying what would happen given the same set of flood routing rules during two different sets of events. I hope that helps clarify. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I'm just looking through my notes. Um, you you talked about developing the long-term hydrograph for the sediment transport model. Um, I'm still a un little unclear on how you did that. You took the, from what I understand, you took the historical record from 1970 through 2019, and then you randomized it. Um, first of all, did you try different randomization ways um, or different combinations? Or did you just settle on the first one that came up? We, we only used the, the one set of randomized data. We didn't look at different randomization outcomes. OK. Um, did, did you plot that? Did you show that what the hydrograph looked like in your report? What, I don't think you did. That's, uh, I don't know, that's really more um, coming out of the sediment transport model study is, do you know, Brent, if that's plotted in your? I don't believe it is plotted in the report. We have the years associated with it in the modeling file, so you can recreate it if you'd like. Did you hear that, Di? So the, yeah, the model yeah, files do contain all that data. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's one part of, that I also missed in there. You've got the operations model for the 12-year period. Can you just confirm why that was? Is that because you only had the power generating information for that 12-year period? Right. So the, the 2004 hourly data actually starts in April, so it doesn't include a full year. So just in order to have a four-year period with, with leap years and have that be able to be regularly repeated, that, that's why we truncated it to 2008 through 2020. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just because the, hour, the hourly data is needed to drive the operations model, and we didn't have that data coming back the, the full 50 years. And did you, 
Uh, that, okay, no, I'll leave that one at that one. Uh, I've just got a note here that, that I think you mentioned during the presentation. You said you uh, allow the spillway discharge to adjust hourly to, cons to compensate for the power buyback. Uh, is it reasonable for GRDA to operate the spillways and adjust them on an hourly basis? I, I don't see why it wouldn't be. The whole, at the moment. Again, this is this is a model and it's just trying to simulate based on an apples to apples approach given the same set of rules, right? How would it operate during two different events? So there's necessarily some difficulty involved in making a rule out of something that that may be something that's a you know a, a regularly communicated decision between GRD and the court during an actual event. So the whole point is that you know if if the market price dropped for some reason, and it doesn't happen all the time, right? It's, it's relatively, you know, rare. But if, if the market price dropped all of a sudden when they're trying to pass a, a large event, you know, they don't have to continue generating power at a loss. They can decide not to generate. And in order to meet the core's directive about the total amount of water released, they certainly could adjust the spillway gate openings in order to compensate for that drop in hydropower output. But I mean, it's, it's a relatively minor distinction. The hydropower output is very small compared to the spillway gate capacity. Um, so it, again, it's, it's not a huge effect overall. Um, thanks, Ron. That's, uh, I'm just going to take a break here. I'm just gonna, I think I've asked all my questions, but I'm just going to go through and make sure and allow someone else to ask the, to have the opportunity right now while I check my notes. Are there any other okay, questions? thank you, Di. Um, Walker, I see you have your hand raised, and Bob, I also see you have your hand raised, so I'll start with Walker and then we'll get to you. Walker? Um, actually, I would, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I would probably defer to Bob. It's possible that he'll ask some of the same questions, but more clearly than I would. So if it's all right with you, I would let him go first. Okay. Um, Bob, you want to proceed with your question? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I actually just have one follow-up question to a series of questions that Di asked. And this relates to the randomization of the years for the sediment transport model simulations. If I understood your answer right, you the 50 year period and you basically did one randomization. And so now you have a new sequence of years uh, that becomes the sequence for the model and transport model input. My question to you is I'm trying to understand the logic of doing that, especially in view of the fact that you only considered one sequence. The actual sequence is a real thing that happened when you randomize uh, to, to the extent that, that there might be other climatic cycles and so on involved in, in how those years played out. Are you not uh, basically eliminating the effects of all the other cyclicity? And how is that randomized uh, sequence of years an improvement over just simply using the sequence that they happened? Sorry, that was a long-winded question, but I hope you got the gist of what I was asking. If not, I'll try it. Understood, and I, I can try to address that. Um, it's it's really something that relates more to the sediment transport modeling, which again we'll present more information on that, and maybe that will help clarify. Uh, but I'd, I'd be interested to know, you know, if you had any thoughts on. You know what? You know if there was a better approach, or you know, what, would, what would you have suggested? I mean, I, we, we did what we did uh, in support of the sediment transport model study objectives, and it seemed like a reasonable approach. But do you have something else to add? Well, I, I guess only to reiterate what was in my somewhat lengthy discussion. The first thing is the sequence, the measured sequence is one that actually occurred, and so presumably it incorporates whatever cyclicity is there in nature. When, when you randomized it, it, using only one random sequence, to me, tells you nothing 
actually, it certainly is not an improvement over what actually happened. And the only way it would be is if you were to run many, many, and they're practically an infinite number that could occur. <laughs> it's 50 factorial, basically. Uh, so you'd have to run a whole bunch of them to understand the statistics. Otherwise, you, you know, and I don't know how sensitive it, the model, the sediment transport model is to the sequence of years. It, probably is somewhat sensitive to that. Uh, so I, I'm just trying to understand how you thought that it improved the, the result. Anyone on the sediment transport model on the chime in? And we can certainly take this up tomorrow or later when you talk about the sediment transport. Model. I, I think that would be a more appropriate time for that question. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have for now. Great, thank you, Bob. Walker, do you have any follow-up questions? Yes, I do. Um, do you hear me okay? Yes. All right, I'm just a little gun shy after that snafu the first time I talked. Anyway, seems like You're I got okay. it now. Um, so I was curious, you know, you took 50 years of historical data and just, you know, randomized it and used that as a 50 year, you know, future hydrograph, I was wondering in the course of doing that, if you made any attempt to look for uh, trends over the course of the historical data um, that might get lost by simply randomizing it and um, sticking it into the future period. Walker, this is Jesse. I'm not sure what the question uh, was there, but uh, can you help us understand what in the study plan requires us to do everything that's under discussion here? I'm, I'm trying to understand what you did do, Jesse. I'm not making an argument about what was required. Right, but let's talk I about mean, what was required by FERC. Let's, let's stick within the confines no, let, no. of the study process. Um, is it... it are you saying it's not within the confines of the study process to tell me whether you looked for trends or not? You either did or you didn't in doing the study. It seems like uh, an odd thing to stonewall on. So, Walker, I'm, I'm responding generally to everything that's been said thus far. Again, I, I wasn't quite sure about your question to Ryan, but I'm speaking generally about all these comments about the randomization, the trends, things like that. So I'm, I'm just trying to gain an understanding from you how you think that we've deviated from the study process. I'm trying to understand what the study did before I can tell whether it deviated. And then to explain what we did. We, we took the 50 years of historical data, randomized it to reshuffle the years, because you don't know what's going to happen in the future, right? I mean, you can't say the next 50 years of hydrology is going to exactly mirror what happened in the past. So on a level, the randomization makes a lot of sense based on future uncertainty. The important factors in the sedimentation processes have all been thoroughly examined by the sedimentation study team. They'll present that information. And I think after you see that, it, it may be you know, compelling and, and convincing that we have looked at the key factors that are important <clears throat> to analyze the rates of sedimentation and potential future changes. Again, who can say exactly what's going to happen based on future inflows that GRD does not control? But I, I believe well, the sedimentation study team will, will be able to show you that they've looked at the important factors. And let, let me just sure. tag in a, a second here. That in looking at the long-term <clears throat> hydrologic record, there really is no trend that we can discern in hydrology. So in our opinion, whether you randomize it or not, uh, there's really no difference because we saw no trend. And um, can you just clarify who that was that would just said that? That was Dr. Bob Simons. And okay. I, I think that speaks to the value of saving this discussion for the sedimentation study. I, I think it'll be productive for all of us here if we table this for now. No, in fact, um, it, it's a question that bears on the sedimentation study, but it relates to how the operations model feeds into the H and H as well. Um, there are a lot of so, interfaces between the different study teams. I sure. am largely at the beck and call of these other 
experts to tell me what the operations model needs to produce in support of their studies, it, it really is not material to the operations model what we're discussing here. Okay, so I, I think I understood Dr. Simons to say that they looked at the long-term hydrologic record and could not discern a trend. Did I hear that right? Yes. Yes. Okay, and is that written up anywhere? This is Brent Teske from the sedimentation team. Yes, that is written into our report. You can look, uh, I don't have the page number in front of me, but that is in our USR sedimentation study report. Okay, and so, so is that trend analysis in the hydrology, that was done by the sedimentation study team? Is that question better left for that study, or I mean, who, who did that? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, and yes. Okay, great, and I'll save it for that, but I do have some more questions. Um, so thank you for clarifying that. Um, I have a, another question that, uh, on a different topic that goes back to one of Dai's first questions about, um, the starting elevations and the, you know, the, the length of the hydrograph. And, um, in terms of what's in the study plan, I think, frankly, there isn't great detail about exactly what those hydrographs are going to look like. Guy's correct that for most of the runs and, and for other than the 100-year hydrograph, all of the uh, very high elevation starting point runs, those are new to us. And this report is the first time we've seen those. Um, I, I guess just to, to start my um, line of questioning on this, I was hoping you could just clarify when we say we're running a hydrograph with a starting elevation of X, like what are we starting? Like what is that the start of? So that, that's the initial condition on the reservoir. So the reservoir is assumed to start full up to that specified elevation. And then again, we're running those hydrographs based on the events identified and presented at the ISR, and in the operations model context, that means that for both the operations model and the flood routing model, the pool is starting at that specified elevation at the you know, reported start date of that event, and then the flood routing model is computed, and then the operations model is computed based on those results. Okay, um, so I think you said it's at the reported start date of that event. So uh, what does that mean? How do we choose that date or, or where do we look it up? If you look in the upstream hydraulic model report and, and also the downstream hydraulic model report, I believe, those uh, dates and times when each event started and ended are reported there. But so how were those selected? Again, those, those were all selected at the ISR, and we don't really want to waste our time here discussing the first study season again. Um, well, I hope you won't find it a waste to, you know, help us understand how the second study year builds on the first. Um, certainly it's useful to me. We didn't change um, that in the study season. Those dates are the no. same. Right, so the dates are the same, notwithstanding the fact that we did a bunch of new runs, and in many of them, the result is that the model draws down the reservoir for four days before the flood hits. I mean, it, 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 my understanding is that's what you're saying, yeah? So, Walker, the, you may not have not seen the 757 stage hydrograph before, but none of this should be a surprise because if you start the pool at 757, regardless of the date, it will, a drawdown will immediately occur because that's an emergency situation. And I just, I just want to reiterate, all of these start dates, they have not changed since the ISR. We received zero comments on the start dates at the ISR. Um, it's, if you can help us understand why this comment on the work that was done during the first study season and was approved by FERC is under, under your consideration. Um, that would be very helpful, I think. 
Otherwise, I think in the interest of time, we're probably going to need to move on because we're already running a little bit behind schedule. Well, I, you know, I guess just to add one clarification, I take your point on 757, but you see it in some of the lower ones too. The 753 and 749 runs tend to have days of, you know, multi-foot drawdown before the floods as well in, in hey, multiple Walker. hydrographs. So, Walker, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Who would be in control in the pools at 753? Well, my understanding is that the core is that a, is would that a trick be. Question? <laughs> well, let can, me ask can you, you just answer thing. the question? And, then, and it would just be very helpful if you could answer that question. My understanding is that by the terms of the water control manual, the core would be in control, but what we don't have is any information about how the core actually instructs GRDA's operations during those times, the degree of specificity, any potential range of flexibility that they do leave to GRDA, um, any of those things. So none of that is in the report and actually would be helpful to know. I don't comment. I mean, all, all I can no. say there is it, it varies, and it's, again, it's specific to what the Army Corps is, is deciding during each event. What we have in the Red Corps model is, is the Army Corps, you know, one of, one of their ways of encapsulating all of that into a set of rules. And what we need for modeling purposes is a set of rules. So you're, you're asking about what happens, you know, in detail in a specific event. That's... Again, that's a little bit outside of the modeling studies because we need we need a rule set in order to model something. We can't have disparate, you know, specific to each event historical instruction. That's not useful for a model. And what we have is the Riverware model, which was developed by the Army Corps to represent all of their rulemaking across events. Well, look, to be clear, I only highlighted that lack of information in response to Jesse's question. I wouldn't have brought it up on my own. But since we're going there, I take your point that you need rules to run the model. But it seems pretty clear that at least in the 2007 event, those rules are a pretty poor representation of what actually happened. And so regardless of whether you need to know what actually happened to run the model, it would be helpful to have it to understand how representative the model is and how useful and trustworthy it is in predicting the future. So I guess that's where I'm saying it would have been helpful to see that stuff. And, and Walker, if you, if you want to disagree with the first process that told us to use the Army Corps of Engineers model as, as a validation tool, I believe, Ryan can fill in the technical details on that. But if you're disagreeing with the first process on that, I think that's a very different conversation. And I would add that we no, validated I, to two historical events that FERC did recommend. And again, that was based on the specific spillagate openings recorded during that event, which is based on the specific instructions given by the Army Corps to GRDA. So GRDA operates based on the Army Corps instructions. We have records of what that operation was and that's what we use for these calibration or validation events. And you can see the outcome. So I don't think the operations model is, is questionable in this case when you do look at the specific historical operations. So do the Corps directions ever leave GRDA flexibility in how to operate even though the Corps is in control? Yeah, I mean, it's my understanding that the, the core communicates a CFS discharge and GRDA follows the direction. I don't know what you mean by flexibility, Walker. So the core specifies the discharge and GRDA just does it? That's right, yes. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so I think that was a bit of a digression. Sorry, that was that was a digression based on Jesse's question to me. But I would like to briefly return to the the timing of the start of the hydrographs, which was okay. what I was going well, to ask before, about. Before you do that, let me just do a little bit of level setting. Okay, it is it's now ten thirty. We were supposed to break 
a half hour ago. And, and then we were supposed to come back 15 minutes ago to start the next presentation. We can go on this as long as participants want to go. Uh, this, is, is, this is good dialogue. It's good to, to, to clarify and answer questions. But I just want to, again, in, in terms of level setting, we are taking time away from the upstream, the downstream, uh, and the, the other presentations today. Do we have um, infrastructure today, too? So again, let's, let's use this time wisely so that we can get through all the material that we have planned today, because it's a lot. Sure, I guess if I might, and I take your point, and I'll be happy for a break as well, but I think just to finally clarify what I understand, it sounds like there wasn't any reconsideration of, you know, the timing of the start of the hydrograph in the last year or in response to what, you know, what we were seeing in that drawdown in most of the uh, different inflow events. Is that right? I think to, to answer that, Walker, uh, correct that apropos of nothing and as part and in a deviation from the FERC process that that would have been, we did not do that. So you are correct that we did not deviate from the FERC process. We did not change the starting dates randomly apropos of nothing. And I really appreciate that clarification. Great, as do I. Uh, I think that's all I had. Uh, it looks like Di, Bob, and Walker, you guys saw their hands raised, so if you'll remove those so it doesn't confuse me in the future. Uh, what, if you, what if we take it? Are there any other questions or dialogue that we want to have on the operations model? I don't see any Q&As or any additional hands raised. So maybe we take just a five minute break, we'll cut it from 15 to five and try to make up some time. So we'll start back at 1040.
Okay, everyone, we're back. We're going to turn it over to Jesse to start the upstream hydraulic model. All right, uh, thank you, Jacqueline. As she said, I will be talking about the upstream hydraulic model component of the h, &H study. So here's a brief outline of what I'll be discussing today. Our objectives, FERC's most recent determination, our UHM objectives, the simulated scenarios, analysis of results, anticipated ops, supporting analyses for other studies, and then conclusions. I will be taking breaks for questions throughout the presentation. Um, so we'll just have those questions held until we get to those points. So again, H&H &H study objectives, this slide should look familiar, just reminding everyone, we have the OM that feeds into the UHM and DHM. Uh, together, those two items comprise the CHM, and that information is fed into other studies as necessary. We also make our own uh, conclusions using uh, the OM and the CHM. Again, listed at the top there are the study objectives directly from the original uh, 2018 documents. So I'm not going to reiterate those, but they are just there for a reminder. So let's discuss briefly FERC's most recent determination in February of 2022. Following the ISR, uh, FERC recommended the following modifications. First is to run inflow event scenarios at starting reservoir elevations between 734 feet PD up to and including 757 feet PD. And as I said earlier today, I will be uh, starting to refer to these just simply as like 734, 757, and not including the feet PD, just because otherwise um, we're going to use up a lot of time just mentioning the datum every time. So also, um, for, uh, recommended that we report the frequency, timing, amplitude, in other words, elevation, and duration for each of the simulated inflow events with those same starting elevations. Then provide the means necessary to complete any additional return frequency analysis that may be deemed necessary following review of the USR. So how did GRDA complete those FERC requested tasks? First of all, uh, GRDA did simulate inflow event scenarios with starting elevations ranging from 734 up to and including 757. Secondly, GRDA reported the timing, frequency, amplitude, and duration of inflow events. Let's break those down one by one. First of all, the frequency of inflow events, which is also known as the estimated return period, uh, was reported. Uh, we have that throughout the report and in our appendices. Uh, the term timing originates in the revised study plan and refers to seasonality of inflow and inundation. So GRDA analyzed the timing or seasonality of normal operational levels and inflows as it impacts uh, three natural resources studies, the aquatics species study, the terrestrial species study, and the wetlands and riparian habitat study. I'll be talking about those a little bit uh, later on toward the end of my presentation. And you're also going to hear a lot you know, from those study leads themselves uh, tomorrow. Um, next, GRDA reported amplitude, in other words, elevation or water surface elevation. And then finally, duration of inundation is reported. Next on how GRDA completed FERC's approved study plan, uh, GRDA has included the return frequency analysis, again, also known as the flood frequency analysis, as an electronic attachment to the USR, and then also as, recruit, as required by the approved study plan, uh, GRDA has developed maps showing areas of potential uh, lentic or lotic conversion. Next, I'll talk about the upstream uh, hydraulic model objectives. In the uh, slightly grayed out list on the right side here, you can see those um, items that were completed for the first study season. On the left, you have things that we are discussing today. That is the simulated scenarios, analysis of results, anticipated operations analysis, supporting analyses for other studies and conclusions. So if, um, or the, the, again, the, uh, the elements that are on the left side of your screen are matters on which FERC has ruled and settled unless they appear on the right side of the screen. I'll take a quick break here for any questions before I dive into a lot more of technical matters. No, any hands raised? So okay, sounds good. 
So diving into the technical details of the UHM, first we'll discuss the simulated scenarios. Let's look at the inflow events and historical pool elevations. I'll walk us through this table. Um, so on the left column there, you have the inflow event. Uh, the first five of six of these events are historical events, meaning that they did occur, and that's why you have the dates there. So you have the September 1993 event, the June 2004 event, so on and so forth. When you get to the 100 year, as the second column indicates, that is the synthetic inflow event, um, because that event has not occurred. There has not been a 100 year inflow event um, at Pensacola Dam. Um, the third column is the estimated return period, or um, the, uh, that, that is the uh, return period is based on the peak, the peak inflow, excuse me, at Pensacola Dam. So you can see those return periods listed. For example, the September 1993 is a 21-year inflow event when measured in terms of peak inflow at the dam. Next, you have the Pensacola Dam historical pool elevation. This is the pool elevation that actually occurred at the start of the simulation. Uh, none of this has changed from the ISR. Uh, again, the 100-year is uh, not applicable for a historical elevation because that's a synthetic event. And then finally, you have the simulation start and end date ranges. Now, we did not, of course, just look at the historical starting stages. We also looked at a number of other starting stages. So you can see there we have the inflow event listed in both um, the historical year uh, and also the return period. And then we have simulations that uh, represented GRD's anticipated operational range. You will note that that middle column ranges from 742 feet PD up to and including 745 feet PD, and that goes in half foot increments. On the right, you have this extreme hypothetical range of starting elevations, which go as low as 734 feet and up to 757 feet. So let's spend a brief moment looking at our simulated peak pool elevations for all of the starting elevations. This includes the extreme hypothetical values that are outside of GRD's anticipated operational range. You see the lowest peak there and the highest peak and also the difference. So what do I mean when I say lowest peak and highest peak? What I mean is for the September 1993 or a 21-year inflow event, if you look at all the simulations that we ran in accordance with FERC's determination, the simulation with the lowest peak at the dam had an elevation of 754.1, and the simulation with the highest peak had an elevation of 757. The reason why that column says 757 for the highest peak for every single simulation is part of the FERC determination. Um, we were required to simulate, as I said before, a starting water surface elevation of 757. Now, of course, that elevation is the top of the dam. It is far above the anticipated operational range. And because that would be an emergency scenario, the water surface elevation immediately begins decreasing. So the peak water surface elevation is, co is the same as the initial water surface elevation. So I've said some of the text that is on this slide already, but I just want to continue to walk us through this because this understanding is very important for the work here today. Again, the highest peak elevation of the pool is unrelated to the magnitude of the inflow event or operations during the inflow event, whether controlled by GRDA or by the Army Corps of Engineers. Rather, the peak elevation is simply the maximum pool elevation simulated in accordance with FERC's February 2022 determination. So the limited usability of that table shows the need for presentation of results within GRD's anticipated operational range rather than just the extreme hypothetical range of starting water surface elevations. And um, again, I want to remind everyone that the extreme hypothetical range, uh, named as such because it is outside of GRD's proposed action, uh, which could also be referred to as the anticipated operations. So let's look at that same table again, but let's look at it now just with peak pools, or we'll look at the peak pools again, but only looking at GRDA's anticipated operational range starting elevations. 
So here you can see that we have the lowest peak and the highest peak. But now the highest peak actually has some variability in it. That is because we are only looking at starting pool elevations that are within GRDA's anticipated operational range. That is 742 feet PDs, 745 feet PD. So before we dive further into the results and the analysis of the results, I'd like to pause for questions here. Um, I do not see any hands raised, so... Okay. Oh, Walker? Just a minute. Yeah. Yes. Just quickly, there was the discussion of the, the one study variance where you um, didn't use part of the bathymetry data from the 2009, as I understood the discussion. Uh, I, I was wondering if you could just briefly kind of explain the issue there and how you resolved it. Um, that's for the sedimentation study, and we'll be discussing that tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry. My mistake. Thank you. Okay. Yep. No problem. Does anyone else have any questions? If so, just be sure and raise your hand. Walker, will you remove yours, please? Thank you. Yeah. All right. Now we'll uh, discuss the analysis of the results. There's a lot of text on this slide, but I'll walk us through it bit by bit. Uh, in that blue box, you'll see just a reminder that FERC's February 2022 determination uh, was to report the frequency, timing, and amplitude, and duration for each of the simulated inflow events. So to that end, from each of our simulations, we extracted the maximum water surface elevation, the maximum inundation extent, and the duration of inundation. Um, we will specifically talk about that timing component later on when we get to the natural resources studies. Uh, in terms of presentation formats in the report, uh, this should be all uh, quite familiar to folks as we have tables of maximum water surface elevations, profile plots of maximum water surface elevations, maps of maximum inundation extents, and now tables of duration of inundation. And just a note before we move on, when we talk about duration of inundation, our definition is that within the boundary of the flow adjustment, duration equals the time of inundation above the flow adjustment elevation, and for outside of the flow adjustment, duration is equal to the time of inundation above the channel bank elevation. Uh, finally, in terms of comparisons, we did look at the impact of starting pool elevations as compared to the impact of inflow events. Um, this would basically be the impact of operations as compared to the impact of nature. And then also we looked at the impacts of both the range of anticipated uh, operations and the extreme hypothetical range. We considered both of those in accordance with first determination. There's a lot going on on this table, but I'll walk us through this one very, very carefully because you will see tables of the same type um, again and again for the next few minutes, and I want to make sure uh, that everyone has a good understanding before we dive in. The inflow events you see there should be very familiar. We have the September 1993 or the 21-year inflow event through the 100-year inflow event. Those next two rows down, I'll talk about a little bit more in just a moment, but those are basically the um, impact of nature. And I also want to mention, before we dive too far in, this is all related to maximum water surface elevations. And as the table title shows, this is all for starting elevations within GRDA's anticipated operational range. We will talk about maximum water surface elevations for the hypothetical range in just a few moments. Um, so let's talk about those first six rows uh, before we dive in uh, to the last two rows. And I also want to note uh, please do note that these columns, uh, uh, the column headings, we have the Neosho River, the Spring River, the Elk River, and Tar Creek. Later on, I'll be using the same archetype of table, but it's uh, for locations only on the Neosho River. So please, I'll, I'll point that difference out when I get to it, but I just want everyone to be keyed in on that before we uh, dive into this. <clears throat> so for those first six rows of um, inflow events, I want to remind everyone that for five of the six, 
the Army Corps is in control when those maximum water surface elevations occur. The pool is above 745. The one exception is the June 2004 event or the one year event. And that event does not exceed the flowage easement for starting elevations within GRDA's anticipated operational range. Regarding the bottom two rows of the table, um, the second to last row has the impact of the inflow events. This is the impact of nature, and that is for the historical inflow events only. And then the final row is the impact of nature for all the inflow events studied, including the 100-year event. As you can see, I've got some footnotes there, so I'll also walk us through those. I'd like to note that the maximum water surface elevation differences for the anticipated operations occur between river mile 112.6 and river mile 128.8, which is downstream of the city of Miami. That is not within the city of Miami where those maximums occur. For the impact of inflow, AKA the impact of nature simulations, the gray rows, the maximum water surface elevation difference occurs at river mile 135.9, which is in the city of Miami, Oklahoma. And then finally, because the 100 year inflow event is synthetic, of course, there is no starting historical pool elevation. So a starting pool elevation of 734 feet PD was used for the 100 year inflow event when calculating the maximum difference in water surface elevation due to all the inflow events, AKA the, the impact of nature. So a little bit more on that table before we move on. The maximum simulated water surface elevation differences due to that change in starting pool elevation within GRDA's anticipated operational range are orders of magnitude smaller than the maximum water surface elevation differences that can be caused by nature. So more specifically, along the Neosho River, if you look at the impact of nature, the impact of nature ranges from 16 to 797 times greater than the maximum simulated impact of GRDA's anticipated operational range. And again, I would be remiss if I did not remind folks that even though it's GRDA's anticipated operational range for those maximums, either the core is in control or the inundation does not exceed the boundary of the flowage um, easement. Uh, for the Spring River, nature's impact is 34 to 525 times greater than the impact of GRDA's anticipated operational range. Along the Elk River, nature has a 31 to 669 times greater impact. And along Tar Creek, nature has a 59 to 2,000 922 times greater impact than GRDA's anticipated operational range. So when we talk about orders of magnitude, those are some of the quantifications we're talking about. Um, next up, we're going to look at that same table archetype again, but now we are looking at the maximum water surface elevations for the extreme hypothetical range, which ranges from 734 up to and including 757. Once again, when you look at this table, um, the, along the Neosho River, the maximum water surface elevation differences for the extreme hypothetical simulations occur at various locations between the dam and River Mile 122. So it's still all downstream of Miami, Oklahoma. For the impact of inflow, in other words, the impact of nature simulations, the maximum water surface elevation difference, of course, still occurs at that same location, 135.9, because now we are looking at, for the first six rows, the extreme hypothetical range, but nature's impact remains the same. So those gray rows on the bottom are repeats from the previous table. But the first six rows of data where the new information is for the maximum hypothetical range. So I'd like to remind everyone here that the results presented here are not based on a proposed operational range from GRD8. This is something that was as part of the study plan determination that we performed. So looking at some quantifications of the numbers in those tables. 
even using these extreme hypothetical starting stages, which range from 734 to 757, the impact of nature is still much greater than that of a 23-foot change in starting pool elevation. Along the Neosho River, the maximum impact of nature ranges from 1.6 to 16 times greater than the maximum uh, simulated impact of that extreme hypothetical range of 23 feet. Uh, along the Spring River, the impact is 2.9 to 111. That's, again, this is the factor that nature is greater. And elk, the factor is 2.1 to 14. And tar, nature has an impact that is 3.0 to 564 times greater than a starting pool stage range of 23 feet. Now, we've looked at the whole river system. We've looked at the Neosho River as a whole, and the Elk and the Spring and Tar as a whole. Let's drill down and look at an area near the city of Miami. And let's only, of course, look at the Neosho River. We're going to go back to discussing GRDA's anticipated operational range. So, River Mile 133 for point of reference, is approximately one mile downstream of Interstate 44. And River Mile 137 is approximately one river mile upstream of Highway 69. You can see the table headings there. You can see the columns, River Mile 133 to 134, 134 to 135, et cetera. So we've taken this river mile range that covers the city of Miami from River Mile 133 to 137, and we've broken it up into four discrete chunks. The results that you're seeing there, again, are for GRDA's anticipated um, operational range. Um, again, recall that two things are true. One is that the core is in control. GRDA is in not, not in control. And that is true for all of the, or five of the six first rows that are in the white color. And then um, for the one outlier there, the June 2004 event, where the core is not in control, um, that inflow event um, is contained within the flooding easement for all the starting elevations within GRDA's anticipated operational range. So regardless, you can see that the in the city of Miami, the water surface elevations are, are minimal in those first six rows. And conversely, the uh, water surface elevation differences that you see in the last two rows are quite big. Those are the ones due to nature. This is that same table archetype, but this is for the extreme hypothetical range that is outside of GRDA's um, anticipated operational range. This is all in the report as well. I, so let's, let's look at both of those tables and let's see what we can say about them. In Miami, any simulated impact, I'm sorry, any simulated impact or starting stage whether it's within GRDA's anticipated operational range or for the extreme hypothetical stages, has little impact on water surface elevation when compared to nature's impact. More specifically or quantifiably, the maximum impact of nature, of nature, ranges from 46 to 3,188 times greater than the maximum simulated impact of GRDA's anticipated operational range. Now, if you look at that extreme hypothetical range, the maximum impact of nature ranges from 2.3 to 531 times greater than this hypothetical extreme starting stage range of 23 feet. With that, and that discussion of water surface elevation, maximum water surface elevations, we'll take a break for questions. Di, I see you have your hand raised. Let me unmute you. You should be able to talk now. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry, I just have you muted. No, you're good. We, we can hear you. Oh, okay, sorry. It was telling me I was still muted. Um, just a quick question, uh, maybe two. What are you using as your definition of immaterial impact for this? Um, 
I don't believe we've gotten to the phrase uh, immaterial yet in our presentation, but are you referring to our discussions of the quantifications of the uh, difference in water surface elevation and the orders of magnitude? Well, yes, you, you go through these and you present for argument's sake, you say it's 0.2 or 0.1 feet difference over a range. And I think in the executive summary, you call it immaterial. So I'd just like to get your definition on immaterial, please. I mean, I would say that's exactly why I flip back to this slide here. If you look at the impact of nature, and remember, this is for the whole Neosho River, not even where uh, the primary level of concern is. Nature has an impact that is 16 times greater or up to 797 times greater than the impact of a starting pool within GRD's operational range with the asterisk that when those maximums occur, the Army Corps of Engineers is in control. I feel very comfortable with that definition of the material. Okay, so you're using, well, let me just rephrase it. Are you using the comparisons for what you call the order of magnitude of nature against the operations you're using that as your definition of immaterial, your, your comparison between the two? So yeah, what we, what we presented at the ISR and what we continue to present is if the concern is flooding in a given area, let's say the city of Miami, who is responsible or what is responsible for that flooding? And when I look at this and I say at minimum, Hold on, let, let me go to the slide for the city of Miami because this is actually for the entire uh, Neosho River. So when you look at Miami, a generous area that goes downstream of, the, of Miami and upstream of Miami, the minimum, the, like the smallest factor you have is 46 times. So the impact of nature, could we call it 50 times? Just, you know, simply we can call it 46 if you like, but 46 times that nature has that factor of impact as compared to the operational range. I mean, if you're looking so at just, what is so I, I, so I think, sorry, I, I think I, it. Go, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Just, just to clarify, I, I think, I think you just confirmed it, but you're, you're, you're comparing the impact of nature versus the impact from dam operations and saying, look, for argument's sake, one's a hundred this hundred times larger, or one's the impact of nature is thirty feet. The impact of operations is one foot. We'll call that immaterial. Is that correct? Yes, with the consideration that the Army Corps of Engineers is in control for those peak water surface elevations, and the process that we are participating in is GRDA's operations as it relates to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, not flood control. Right. And under the assumption the dam's in place and this wouldn't happen if you didn't have a dam. Is that part of the FERC process? Yeah, no, that's, that's no. uh, beyond the scope of relicensing, Di. Okay, I'll leave that one. Uh, the. No, the thing that caught my eye, you've got a much larger, much larger emphasis on this impact of nature in this last report compared to what you had in this report. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, we're kind of losing you a little bit. Can you, sorry. Can you speak again? Uh, no, I've got my headphones on. Um, there just okay. seems to be a much larger emphasis on the impact of nature in this latest report, and I'm trying to understand why. And I think you've described it because you're comparing the results to the operations and using that as a sort of a definition of what you call material. So at the ISR, we said that the impact of nature was orders of magnitude greater than GRDA's impact. And we noted that the core is in control of flood control operations. And when you're looking at impact of nature versus impact of starting pool, you're actually looking at nature compared to the course flood control. And what we attempted to do here in the updated study report is provide some quantifications 
because one of the comments that I believe you and others made at the ISR was, you know, what is your definition of immaterial? And I, we want to provide these quantifications. And I really hope this helps um, everyone understand what we're talking about when we say orders of magnitude. When you're looking at, you know, on, on one side you have one apple, and on the other side you have 3,188 apples. That's the comparison we're making. And we're trying to present these results in a way that is understandable to both technical and laypersons. Uh, okay, I, I don't have, uh, maybe you can just go back to the slide you were on last. Uh, just, just want a small clarification, I don't think it's a big one. I'm sorry, which, uh, which slide? Um, I, I think, I don't oh. recall the slide number. You okay. had a comparison of what the 100 year was as well. Let me, I believe, was it this one here? Yeah, that one there. So, okay. so this is what the, under the anticipated operational range. Okay. Yeah, this is for the anticipated operational range from 742 feet PV to 745 feet PV. And that's over the entire Neosho River, for example, and over the entire Spring River? Yes, okay. correct. So that also includes you know, those maximums, they, they could occur right at the dam. Okay. Which is why so we for, oh, go ahead. Please go ahead. And, and for the 100 year event, especially on the Neosho River, is that assuming the inflow discharge of whatever peak of what, 300,000 or 308,000? Is that correct? I don't know the number off the top of my head right now, but it is the exact uh, flow peak and hydrograph that FERC required us to use in their study plan determination. Okay, so I'll clarify. I think the peak inflow on the Neosho River is actually greater than the 100 year inflow for entire Grand Lake. And the city still, can, still has issues with that 100 year flood as being completely unreasonable to put the entire inflow for Grand Lake into the Neosho River and then use that as a comparison for the 100 year event. The, so, the only thing I will say is that I, I need to stand against the, the mischaracterization that we put all of the water on the Neosho River. That is not what we did. But I would also like to remind uh, everyone else, really more that's listening, is that you raised this concern at the ISR and FERC ruled against you. Yes, and I will still contend that it doesn't make physical sense. So I'll leave it at that. If you would like to refile that same comment, I, I believe you are welcome to do so. Will do, thank you. Okay. Uh, Di, is that all the questions you had? Uh, it is for now, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, Dr. Thomas, I should say. Thank, thank you, I appreciate those questions. No, um, Di is fine too. Okay, all right, I just, I wanna be kind and respectful here. We have a question from Kirk staff on YouTube. Okay. Um, and you choose me too, just a second. Okay, go ahead, me too. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, going back to what Guy oh. first asked, uh, I think that's a point of confusion for me as well. So, you know, what we were looking for with our study plan determination, um, you know, was a comparison of lower and higher water surface elevations and how that impacts upstream water surface elevations. Um, and at the ISR and within this report, there's reference to Mead and Hunt's definition of a material difference being 0.5 feet or greater. And so going through the, the USR, and specifically the upstream hydraulic modeling report, um, you know, table 19, table 20, I see that there are water surface elevations above 0.5 feet for certain events um, on some of the rivers upstream. And so I'm, I, I, we really need a definition of what you're considering material versus immaterial difference and, and clarity on, you know, those, those model runs and simulations that produced water surface elevations upstream that are greater than 0.5 feet, which is I, my understanding was the definition that was being used moving forward. 
Okay, I, I think that's an excellent question. This is an excellent opportunity to, to clarify that, so thank you. Um, so I flipped here to my slide of maximum water surface elevation differences in Miami, Oklahoma. Um, so for one thing, you will see that there are, are no values in this table that are above 0.5 feet. So that's, and I actually, I want to get to a greater clarification in a moment, but I'm actually going to deal with the more granular issue first. Um, and that is when we looked at that other table and you see values that are whatever the value may be, that is along the entire Neosho River, along the entire spring elk and tar. So when we look at, let's say, let's look at the hypothetical um, extreme range. Your maximum water surface elevation for that simulation of 757 is going to be 757 because the maximum is also where it starts, right? So you're always going to be comparing to that. But that's, that's at the dam. So when I go back and I look at this table of maximum differences along the entire Neosho River for that hypothetical extreme range. So if you see the value of 12.82 feet for the June 2004 event, that's occurring at the dam. But it's full, you know, it's, we're still reporting it along the entire river. However, with that granular point in mind, I, I want to rewind back to the revised study plan and FERC study plan determination. In our revised study plan, we talked about a definition of material difference specifically in regard to the upstream limits of the model. And we said that if we find a difference in water surface elevation of half a foot or greater, we would extend the models further upstream. And so at the ISR, we presented our definition of material difference and showed that our models were sufficient and we did not need to extend them further upstream. And we also, um, there was this, a, a similar discussion at the ISR where our conclusion that GRDA's operations have an immaterial impact, and perhaps that was a, well, you know, we could have picked a different word, I guess, because there are two separate things here. One is material difference from the revised study plan, specifically related to the upstream extent of the model. The other is more or less a single word that can encapsulate the fact that nature has a tenfold or 100-fold or over 1,000-fold impact as compared to nature. So we are actually talking a little bit about apples and oranges when we talk about material difference. And I believe this is a matter that um, the commission has, has ruled on in the ISR. That's in, I believe it's section six of our report. Please don't quote me on that, that integer. But there's a specific section regarding material difference where we uh, show how we met the requirement of FERC's approved study plan from 2018, and we did not need to extend our models further upstream. I know that was a lot, but I, I hope that um, comprehensively answers the question. Um, it provided a little bit of clarity. I'm still confused, but I'm going to let you continue with the presentation, and maybe that will... Um, clear up some of my questions, but I'm still a little unsure of what numerical definition or numerical threshold we're, we're using here to measure material versus immaterial. But um, in the interest of okay. time, please continue. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I would, I, I think this will become evident as we continue to present today, but when we talk about GRDA's operations having a material difference, we're, we're saying we feel safe that when we talk about a, a factor of 1,000 or something, that's safe. I, I think these numbers could actually be a lot, or the factors could be a lot lower, um, because we need to look at what is causing the impact. That is the root that we're looking at here. So is nature causing the impact, or is, is GRDA causing the impact, or is, the art, you know, is GRDA's anticipated range causing the impact? Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, Walker, you have your hand raised. Are you there? Yes, yes, I am, okay. thanks. Um, so first of all, uh, um, 
just to clarify my understanding, and I think my team's is similar to what Jesse just put forward about the, the quote unquote material difference being 0.5 feet, that is section six in the report, as Jesse recalled. And, and my understanding mirrors what he just said, that, that in that context, that's used only for setting the sort of geographic boundaries of the, uh, of the model. So I guess just, just to make sure my restatement, Jesse, we're in agreement on that. Walker, this is my most joyous moment of the day. We are in agreement on that. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. Uh, I might have another easy one for you too. Just to confirm, when you talk about uh, the easement elevation, we're talking about 760 NGVD, is that right? Um, it is the flowage easement. I might have to phone a friend on on that on the flowage easement, but I, we are looking at um, you know we're looking at technical materials that I have at my at my disposal when I look at the flowage easement. Okay. Um, but so setting aside section six because that's a, a a different use of a similar term for a discrete purpose. Uh, I, I'm with. FERC staff on this, I don't think I see anywhere that you've actually defined immaterial. There's not, you haven't given sort of a numerical or qualitative cutoff where one amount of difference would be immaterial and another would not. Am I missing that? I, I think I want to cordially say, I think I've, I think I've exhaustively covered this. I don't, I don't have anything to add. Okay. And certainly there's no kind of citation or standard, um, you know, standard rule of thumb in the in the profession or anything that you're that you're pointing to for that determine of, determination of immateriality is there? No, there I, there is no engineering uh, definition that covers all models and all river systems and all types of studies on what is material and what is not. When when you look at what is material for the H and H study versus what is material for I don't know like a aquatic study or something that that is going to be those are going to be different terms yeah so so we don't have a definition covering all models and river systems we also don't have an engineering definition covering this system that you've advanced so it's sort of sort of uh it's like obscenity you know when you see it is that where we're at i would say it's 797 times when i see it because i i know i know uh, the supreme court i believe the supreme court that you're uh discussing i know when i see it um, that is a little bit uh, more difficult than a direct quantification that nature has a 16 to 797 times impact. I, I do, I, I want to keep moving in the interest of time because I feel like we're spinning our wheels a little bit here. No, this to me is the core conclusion of the entire study. So I think it's important to understand as best you can help us what you mean when you say immaterial. So if it's all the same to you, it would be a priority for us to stay on this topic a minute longer. Okay, so then our, in, in this context with this study, our definition of immaterial uh, impact is that the impact of nature is orders of magnitude a greater for, um, for starting elevations within GRD's operational range. And you still have orders of magnitude, even when we are looking at a 23 foot difference in starting water surface elevation at the dam. So, if I want to understand whether project operations make a difference in how flood X affects the area around the project, why do we care that flood Y is bigger? I'm sorry, what was the last part? Why do we care about what? If we're trying to understand, we've got a given flood, we want to, we want to examine how project operations affect the course of that flood and come to some kind of conclusion about whether those, whether those operations matter. So if we're investigating, you know, the impact of project operations on flood X, it's not clear to me why we care that flood Y was larger. I, I don't follow your logic. I mean, it just doesn't, it seems like it tells us nothing about project operations impact on how a given flood proceeds to say that some other flood is of a different size. So is GRDA in control of nature? No. And so the size of the flood does matter. Um, why? 
I mean, GRDA is in control or at least responsible for project operations. So. Okay, you asked why. If a one year event moves down the river or a 100 year event moves down the river, which do you think is going to have a bigger flooding impact? This is not a trick question. No, of course, the, the bigger flood will have a bigger flooding impact. Okay. But the question is just because a bigger flood will flood more, why does that mean we don't care about project operations impact on a smaller flood? What we have done here is we have looked at GRD's anticipated operational range and simulated the different starting water surface elevations within that operational range to determine if there is an impact of GRDA's operations and can GRDA have an impact on a given flood. That is why we've simulated six floods in accordance with FERC study plan determination. That is why we've looked at water surface elevations from 734 to 757 in accordance with FERC's determination. So can you imagine any project where the same conclusion wouldn't hold that, you know, that you couldn't say project operations on a five-year flood don't matter because a hundred-year flood is much larger? I think that's I mean, not a fair characterization of what I just said. Well, no, I'm trying to understand because I, I really don't get the, the cross-flood comparison as a criterion for why project operations matter or don't for a given flood. Again, we, we set out in within the confines of FERC study plan determination to determine that very question. Do GRD's operations have some sort of impact on upstream flooding? And we find that nature is the complete driver. You, you, like, if you want to put it in a very simple way, GRDA can't beat nature. Well, you're saying GRDA shouldn't try and affect what's happening naturally on a small flood because a big flood would be worse. Isn't that not what you're wait, saying? Wait, no, wait. Walker, you, you asked what makes this project different from others. And what I would say I didn't, to that question. I, 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 that's what I heard. So what I would answer in response to that question, whether it was asked or not, is that this project is very different in the sense that Congress has established who's in charge of controlling floods. At other projects that FERC regulates, that's not the case. But here, it is very much the case that the Corps of Engineers calls the shots whenever the flood is anticipated to go above 40, uh, 745 or actually does go above 745. So that's part of the reason why the analysis is saying what it says, which is the, the, you know, any impacts that may be caused by the uh, uh, dam operations, first of all, get lost in the noise when you're talking about a difference of 797 times or 2,922 times versus what the core's operations in those circumstances uh, may cause. But in either case, it's not GRDA's responsibility and it's not GRDA's operations. So that's the difference. So, so I think, Chuck, if I understand, you're saying it's immaterial because the core directs the operations. Well, I, I'm saying both. I don't see that in the study. Well, because that's, okay. that's, that's a regulatory conclusion. What we're talking about here is the physical uh, analysis. Um, and okay. again, Jesse's been very clear all day today that in these, these circumstances, except for one, that these events occur when the core is directing the operations of this reservoir, not GRDA. But the other thing that I said is Again, even if you look at the total contribution and, and of, of a flooding event, the Corps' operations have, you know, we, we call it mag orders of magnitude. I'll throw another term on the table, a minuscule, uh, you know, undetectable. <laughs> I mean, what, whatever adjective you want to put on it, when it's one out of 797, one out of even 34, one out of 669, that is the order of magnitude that we're talking about here. I don't think that this concept is difficult to understand. 
Well, here's where it is, though. I, I mean, I, I hear you saying that these things are, they all sort of obviously meet your intuitive definition of immaterial. But, you know, it's not hard to imagine that doing similar runs with some different assumptions might yield, you know, different numbers, even here, even though I don't understand the utility Robert, of comparing. A, I, I, I'm I have sorry, to take may I finish? No, I have to take issue with that. Because what we did here is precisely what the commission has required us to do and precisely what we've been talking about for the last seven years. And so the suggestion that if we pull a lever here or make a little tweak there is going to make a significant change, that ship sailed years ago and we've been responding to those questions to make this model reliable and accurate for this whole time. So if you have an answer for how we can tweak this model to make it more accurate so it represents your view of the world, I think it's time for you to belly to the bar and tell us what you, what you have in your pocket. Sure, and, and we, we may very well agree, and it may be time for us to, you know, to make some of those tweaks and do some runs ourselves. Uh, well, you know, you before we do that, it would be helpful, Chuck, Chuck. It would be helpful before we do that if we had, you know, a sort of a priori understanding of what output would or wouldn't be immaterial. I mean, it doesn't seem like we have a principal basis where we could, you know, have different people look at a set of outputs and reproducibly agree whether the difference is material or immaterial. So, I'm not Walker, hearing to that. that to that to that point, quantifications were requested at the ISR. We've added quantifications. I don't think it's very fair to say before you did, I mean, this model has been sitting available to you for quite some time. We haven't seen anything to Chuck's point given back to us. You, you don't need some sort of different quantification for us for you guys to do your own work and to present something different if you feel that it's relevant. No, of course, but we, what we don't have is a definition that we could apply to results if we generate some. And that precluded you from from generating results? No, I'm not saying that. It's GRDA's study period. I think I understand. If you don't have, if you don't know the magic number you're looking for, you cannot wrench the model to get it to say what you want it to say. Is that correct? I, th I think you're accusing me of bad faith. Did I hear that right? Guys, this is neat. With Eric. Can we please stick to, you know, a polite conversation and asking and answering questions to the best of our abilities? Happy to. Walker, are you happy to? I think the last thing I heard was that I was accused of bad faith. So no, that, those were your words. Where are we Walker. at on that? Yeah, let's let's. Th th I don't think that Jesse right. was accusing you of bad faith. That, th that was your term. Yeah, all right. I think Jesse's words were wrench the model to produce a desired result. Did I remember that right, Jesse? I mean, I said what I said, and I, I can't change that. I, that is what I'm hearing from you, though, because um, we are, you know, we are saying that the dam or the GRDS operations has an immaterial impact. We, the, so, the request was for more, quant can I finish, please? Um, so, the, the request was for more quantification, and we provided more quantification. And, and you said, I can't run the model until I know, like, the magic number I'm looking for. And as a technical person, no, my, my didn't thought that. process goes to that. That doesn't sound like the correct scientific process. And I think to, to, kind of I agree cool, with that. to kind of cool the level in the room down and to bring us back to where we were at the start of the day, the purpose is, you know, what, where does the evidence lie? Who has done the scientific work? And I mean, if you have scientific work that refutes the scientific work that we are presenting, that's what we're here to discuss today. And that is what my comment drives at. Well, there's, there, there are other times for that in the real life process as well. Um, we're here trying to understand what you've done. And I think you did mishear what I was saying. It wasn't that we can't do modeling until we have, uh, you know, a criterion for materiality to apply. It was that we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we, even if we did modeling, we wouldn't know whether to call it immaterial or not uh, without a definition to apply. And you haven't given us one. So, I mean, we would have to, you know, come up with a range like this and I suppose, you know, ask you all if you think it's immaterial. Suppose it's eight instead of 16, you know? 
I think one out of eight is still an order of magnitude. That's all. That's we're almost saying. an order of magnitude. So it's it four on. instead of sixteen. Can we stipulate the base ten? Sure. Brilliant. So suppose it's four in, instead of sixteen. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Like, but it's not. There's. There, we don't have anything to apply. Well, uh, yeah, right. Under your model runs, it's not. So anyway, uh, we, we would love to, well, I think we just don't have a definition that could be applied, you know, uh, and, and uh, reproducibly to other sets of model results. So I think we might just have to leave it there. Okay. Um, and then a related question, are we going to talk about the lateral flooding extents later, or if I have a question on that, should I ask it now? That is uh, coming up after this uh, brief Q&A session. Great. Uh, I think that's okay. all I've got for now. Sounds good. Jesse? Yes. Uh, Stephen Boulder with FERC has his hand raised. Okay. Stephen, you may go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, first, I want to endorse Nitu's comment. Um, I think the emphasis here is there's going to be different opinions. We want to make sure the models have the information that we ask for in a way that people can understand it and, and um, make their own interpretations. Um, along the lines of sort of interpreting some of the discussion, I wonder if it's fair to say without um, criticizing, critiquing or endorsing this thought, but is it the, uh, is it the uh, opinion of GRDA that essentially the, the difference that there are you're emphasizing in here the differences are so extreme that there was no no cases that um, would have been within a a boundary of um, of fact or you'd say that all your analysis will prove the um, the effect to be so minor compared to this ratio that you didn't define it because it wasn't relevant to any of these cases, any of these analyses? Yeah, I think that's a very fair characterization. I, I know that we have lawyers involved here, but I, when I see, as an engineer, when I see the number that the minimum is 16 times along the whole Neosho River, and that minimum number only goes up when we look in areas of, of concern, that is where I, I stand, and I, I feel like we don't need to go a step further. So I, I think that's well put. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes, thank you. Sorry, I was looking at Jacqueline to see if we had other other folks that were uh, waiting in line. No. Okay. So now we will talk about um, inundation area differences, and you're going to see a number of similar tables uh, as before, as I've been saying. So here again, we have those six rows of our varying inflow events. And on the bottom two, we have those impact of nature uh, quantifications. Um, here you can see on, we have GRDAs, um, four, four, GR, excuse me, four GRDAs anticipated operational range. We have the smallest and the largest areas of inundation. And uh, then we have the difference on the far right on, and again, I just want to remind everyone that for five out of six of those first rows, the core is in control. And for the June 2004, the inundation extent um, does not uh, exceed the flooding easement. Um, moving on. Once again, similar to the maximum water surface elevations, um, the simulated inundation differences due to that change in starting pool within GRDs anticipated operational range are orders of magnitude smaller than the inundation area differences that can be caused by nature. So more specifically, if only the historical inflow events are considered, the maximum impact of nature ranges from 35 to 4,444 times greater than the uh, maximum simulated impact of GRDA's anticipated operational range. And if all events, including the 100 year are considered, that range 
where uh, you're looking at the factor that nature is greater than GRD's anticipated operational range is 43 to 5,479 times greater. Next, we'll look at that same table, but now we are looking at the extreme hypothetical range of starting elevations. So this is down to 734, up to and including 757. Once again, I'd like to remind everyone that when the water surface elevation goes above 745, uh, the core is in control. And if, once again, a reminder, just as a refresher from that last section, the last two rows in this table are going to be the same as the last two rows in the previous table uh, because nature is the kind of constant between these two comparisons. Looking at that table, um, if we use this extreme uh, hypothetical range of starting stages that go from 734 to 757, the impact of nature is still much greater than that 23 foot change in starting pool elevation. And more specifically, if only the historical inflow events are considered, the maximum impact of nature ranges from 1.7 to 29 times greater than the maximum simulated impact of that extreme range. And if all the inflow events, including the 100 year, are considered, that range is 2.1 to 36. Next, and similar to the water surface elevation discussion, we are going to look at inundation extent, but just in the city of Miami and, and in the area upstream and downstream. Once again, we are looking from River Mile 133 up to uh, 137. Again, we have these in one uh, River Mile blocks here, uh, four blocks. Once again, I've got to remind everyone that for five out of those six of the first six rows, I, when we're looking at GRDA's anticipated operational range, the core is in control for the June 2004. Um, it's within the flow adjustment. And again, the bottom two rows are for nature with and without the 100 year. Here is that same table, but for the extreme hypothetical range. So what can be said? In Miami, any simulated impact of starting stage, whether within GRD is anticipated operational range or for extreme hypothetical stages, has little impact on inundation area when compared to nature's impact. Uh, more specifically, the maximum impact of nature ranges from uh, 13 to, uh, I'm sorry, 8,917 times greater than the maximum simulated impact of GRE's anticipated operational range. And the maximum impact of nature ranges from 1.2 to 1,633 times greater than the maximum simulated impact of an extreme hypothetical starting stage range of 23 feet. So with that, I um, went through that a little bit faster as we get more comfortable with these tables. Um, that is inundation area extents. So we'll take a brief break for questions, and then we'll move on to a discussion of duration of inundation. And uh, Jesse Dye has his hand raised. Dye, you may proceed. Um, yes, would you, I think, go to slide 34, please? Oops, going the wrong way. Okay. Uh, no, I got the wrong slide. Maybe this previous before that where you showed areas of inundation. Okay, there. Is it? Yeah, want, that one there. The, okay, okay. Oh, 131, that's great. So in okay. this slide here, you report the areas and the percentage difference. And if you'd go to slide 35 now. Uh, yes, okay, that's fine. Um, that one is just for the city of Miami for different river miles, and it just shows the percentage increase. Can you give us some idea of what increase in area it is within the city of Miami for those? Because the percentage doesn't, uh, I can't put it in context. I just want to know how much of an area. Is it 20 acres, 1,000 acres? Can you give me some context to how much the increase is? Yeah. So I, I do not have those numbers off the top of my head. Um, I will say that we added these tables in at the USR um, because of the discussion that we had at the ISR, where when we reported a maximum difference along the entire Neosho River, um, you know, some folks honed in on that and, and presumed that it was in the city of Miami. So we wanted to provide uh, this granularity to show the results in the city of Miami. 
we did not uh, present acreages um, in the report. And so, uh, you know, percentages are what we have. And, you know, the key understanding of this table is looking at the percentages in the gray rows um, as compared to the percentages in the uncolored, the white rows, and, and the striking difference between those. Okay. Yeah, the, the gray rows really just muddies the whole conversation for me. I'm just kind of interested in the amount of acres increased or decreased under each condition. So when you divide it, so, you know, in most cases, we can go to your hydraulic model. We can go to a point and figure out the water surface elevation. How did you delineate the areas for the river miles, say, between 133 and 134? Is it perpendicular to the river flow, or is it horizontal? How, how did you determine those areas? Yeah, these are this, this is a little bit different than the, than the water surface elevation section. We, you know, we delineated lines perpendicular to the flow uh, for these inundation areas. Okay, so if needed, either you could reproduce it, the acres, or we could go and, and determine the increase in that number of acres. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and I believe that is the, the reason that FERC required GRDA to make its models available to the relicensing participants, that if we present things in a certain way, and others want to look at things a slightly different way, that that is available to the relicensing participants. Okay, it, uh, follow up question. Is there anywhere you determine the areas inundated outside the easement? How much area under both conditions? Uh, we do not report that, that no. Uh, okay, thanks, that's all I have at the moment. Yeah, I would say to the, to that point on that question, I would like to, you know, remind everyone. I I sound like a um, broken um, record here, but when the core is in control um, for for these events, um, GRDA, you know, no longer has control of those operations. I mean, it kind of says it right there on the tin. The core is in control. But uh, thank you, Di, for your questions. I just wanted to make that quick comment. Uh, Jacqueline, anything else before we move on? Yes. Uh, Walker has his hand raised. Okay. Yeah, so, yes, thank you. So when, when we, you know, getting back to sort of the ultimate conclusion about whether project operational impacts are material or immaterial, um, as it applies to the to these sort of, you know, lateral extent acreage questions, I mean, it seems it seems kind of implicit, but I want to be clear that, you know, you're saying that these differences in lateral extent are also immaterial, I presume, because otherwise, because that's sort of implicit in the larger conclusion. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah, so when we look at the maximum impact of nature in the area, in the broader area of the city of Miami, the impact of nature ranges from 13 to 8,917 times greater than the maximum simulated impact of GRDA's anticipated operational range. I think that was a yes. I, I, I'm just, okay. It, yeah, I mean, I mean, right, if you're saying that the difference in project operational impacts is immaterial, that, that includes within it an implication that the impacts on lateral extent are immaterial. Is that fair? It, again, yes, not a that, question. That's correct. Right? And, and that's, <laughs> to I, use a favorite phrase. <laughs> yes, and that's why we say that in the conclusions of our report, yeah. we say in regard to water surface elevation, inundation extent, and duration of inundation. Sure. Uh, but so then Di asked whether you had looked at, you know, how much of the additional acreage flooded was within or outside the easements, and you said you hadn't looked at that. So is it fair to say that this notion of immateriality does not incorporate whether GRDA has rights for flowage on the flooded lands? I, I would say that the impact of nature ranges from 13 to 8,917 times greater than the impact of GRDA's anticipated operational range. Um, I, I feel like we are 
going to head start heading back into a, a difficult conversation again if I don't stick to what the technical findings of the H and H study are. Okay, that's, I guess I'll leave it at this. I don't see any any discussion that whether GRDA has rights to any of the area has any impact on your determination of immateriality. So it looks to me like that's not a factor. And if I've misunderstood that, I, I hope you'll point me there. But that's what I will take away otherwise. So, Jesse, the, the, the percentage, like let's go to that table with the percentages. That, yeah, this one, that one is fine. That 1.1% would represent theoretically lands in which there is a flowage easement and lands that are not, right? That would encompass both of those things, yes. That's right. So if the, if, if the exercise was to focus just on the lands that uh, there is no flowage easement, which way would the percentage go? It'd go down because we're talking about fewer acres theoretically because the, the flowage easements are around the flowage. Mm -hmm. They're not in upland areas. Sure, sure. So that's the only point I would like to make there in response to Walker is, yeah, we th this these tables represent all lands, but it's important to recognize that the flowage easements are along the flowage. And so these, these figures are expected to go down if what we're looking at are just areas that are um, outside of those flow easements. Yeah, I understand that. But it doesn't look like that was a factor in, in this ultimate immateriality conclusion. But yeah, I mean, that's not I, something I that, you know, that, that we were asked to look at. Okay, great. Thank you. And that's all I had on that. Okay. Okay. There are no other hands raised. Okay. Now let's discuss uh, duration differences. These tables should look really familiar at this point. What is presented on this slide is the maximum duration difference in hours for starting elevations within GRDA's anticipated operational range. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that, um, well, first I'll cover the footnote that along the Neosho River, the largest differences in duration for the anticipated operation simulations occur in rural, sparsely populated areas. The large di largest differences are between River Mile 124 and 125, which is between Twin Bridges and um, S590 Road Bridge. I would also uh, like to remind everyone that um, the Army Corps is in control when those differences in duration occur for those first six rows. Um, look at the same thing, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, let's look at the um, conclusions from that information. And that is, once again, we're talking about orders of magnitude here. Um, I, don't, I don't believe I need to read this information all up the slide here, but the, uh, the maximum impact of nature along the Neosho River ranges from six to 261 times greater than the maximum simulated impact of GRDA's anticipated operational range. And you can see the other numbers for the other rivers there as well. Also, I should uh, mention that footnote that um, some of these maximum duration differences for a given inflow event on a given reach are zero. In such instances, we use the value of one hour instead of zero to calculate the ratios because mathematically you need some sort of uh, number that is not zero. This is that same uh, table type, but for the extreme hypothetical range. Looking at that table, we can still see that the uh, impact of nature is much greater than that of a 23 foot change in starting pool elevation. Along the Neosha River, the maximum impact of nature ranges from four to 10 times greater than the maximum simulated impact of an extreme hypothetical starting stage range of 23 feet. And then um, again, that same, that same caveat about the one hour versus zero hour um, still applies. Looking back at the anticipated operational range and looking in the city of Miami, um, here is the table for that from River Mile 133 to 137. 
Here is that same table again, but now it's for the extreme hypothetical range. Again, nature is constant, but across those two tables, very similar to what we've looked at for inundation area and maximum water surface elevation. So um, regarding Miami, any simulated impact of starting stage, whether within GRDA's anticipated operational range or for extreme hypothetical stages, has little impact on duration when compared to nature's impact. More specifically, the maximum impact of nature ranges from 42 to 223 times greater than the maximum simulated impact of GRDA's anticipated operational range. Once again, nature the impact goes from 42 to 223 times that of GRDA's anticipated operational range. And regarding the extreme hypothetical range, the impact of nature ranges from 3 to 223. We'll take a short break for questions, and then we'll talk about the graphical results. Uh, Walker has his hand raised. Okay. Walker. Uh, yes, although if uh, any of our technical folks are in the queue, I would, as usual, defer to them. Uh, nobody else has raised their hand. Okay. Um, so, sort of similar to the discussion on uh, the lateral extent of the flooding, is it fair to say that your overall conclusion of immateriality kind of has nested within it, the conclusion that the uh, extended duration of flooding is also immaterial? That is correct. Okay. Um, and, I, you know, I'm curious, I, I guess I've been curious on, on several of these different parameters, but, you know, on this one we're down in what you're calling the extreme range of different project operations, although I understand that to, you know, be a range that the project historically has operated within. Um, you know, you're, you're down to differences of about three or four times, even when comparing a three-year flood to a hundred-year flood. So, um, I, I guess just for the sake of trying to understand, you know, this, as I see it, ill-defined notion of immateriality. Would you say that a three- or four-fold, um, you know, difference compared to, you know, the, the natural differences is immaterial? Uh, let, me, let me clarify something for you there, Walker. Um, when you talk about three, you're talking about comparing a 23-foot range of the starting stage going from 734 feet up to 757 feet. That's the top of the dam. Because I think you kind of just mixed apples and oranges there. So I want to clarify for the audience. When we're looking at GRDA's anticipated operational range, the maximum simulated impact starts at 42 times, where nature has a 42 times impact and goes up to 223. Does that clarification yeah. change? Go ahead. No, no, I, I, it doesn't. I, I'm sorry I wasn't clear in my question. I, I do understand that distinction, but it's fair to clarify it because it's easy to, to lose it at times, and I probably have other times today. Um, I, I guess I was saying, well, let's take what you call the extreme range as a, you know, as a test case for what's immaterial, and, and does a threefold increase, is that a material difference? You know, ignoring kind of, you know, the scenarios that generated that threefold, just, you know, is, is, you know, the fact that project operations on a small flood uh, can generate a third as much uh, flooding duration or variation in flooding duration as switching to a 100-year, what you call a 100-year flood, is that immaterial? Yeah, Walker, good question. And I think that there are, that there's something that needs to be said relative to duration uh, that's a bit unique. Um, and, and first, a matter of clarification, when we talk about you know, these, these words that we keep throwing around, immateriality, orders of magnitude, de minimis, you know, whatever uh, word we use, it's really important to recognize that in, in our context, it's in areas where GRDA's operations have an effect and where GRDA can do something about it. With regard to duration, the reason what makes that a unique circumstance is the CORE's manual specifically talks about duration. And it goes back to this issue of balancing the system and specifically um, the importance of allowing for the generation down of water levels so that the hydropower potential not at GRDA's operations per se, 
but the downstream federal projects can capture that energy as it's as it's flown as as the water is um, is released throughout the system. That's not something that's within GRDA's control at all. And again, it's written right into the floor and into the Corps uh, flood control manual. I think we've had this conversation before, but I'm happy to provide that reference to the flood control manual if it would be helpful. No, we've got that. Um... So I, just to clarify one thing, I mean, you said when we use these words like immaterial order of magnitude, we're only talking about GRDA operations and where GRDA can do something about it. Two things on that. One is I was just trying to take the three number as a hypothetical and see if we could apply this notion of immateriality, immateriality to understand how it might be applied if the, um, you know, the multiples were smaller than what's been presented in some of these scenarios. So that doesn't particularly, you know, it's a hypothetical, so it doesn't really relate to you know, whether it's the result of GRDA operations or not. But um, a, a factual question, I mean, my understanding is GRDA could operate at lower levels than what it is uh, saying it intends to under its anticipated operational scenario. So I guess, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but just as a matter of fact, there's nothing preventing GRDA from doing that, is there? Well, I, I, uh, absent, I, I, absent the core, you know, constraints. Well, no, there's plenty of things. Um, we have a project to operate here. Uh, and, and there are lots of public uh, interests associated with the, 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 the uh, Grand Lake. Uh, there's tremendous economic drivers um, related to, for example, recreation. Uh, real estate investment and taxes that rely on the sure, presence sure, sure. Of, of, uh, of, of GRDA's project. You also have the need for hydroelectric power me. generation. Sorry. I, I'm sorry, I need to finish answering your question. And, and then you right. also have a water supply component. So when you say that you know, nothing uh, disallows, I can't remember exactly the word that you used, GRDA from operating at a low water level, all of those factors go into the decision of where GRDA decides to operate. If you're asking the question of, is it physically possible for Pensacola Dam to be operated at low, lower levels? Well, the answer, of course, is yes, but that's not really the question that needs to be asked here. The question is, what's in the overall public interest? And that's why GRDA spent a lot of time in developing what its anticipated operations are going to be under the new license. Uh, and that's where we came up with the 742 to 745 ban. Sure. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you that there's a lot of considerations that go into how GRDA should operate the project. And those are, you know, obviously different than how it, you know, physically could. Um, uh, that's sort of my point. Um, and, you know, there probably are areas where we can agree that, you know, GRDA shouldn't do something that it could, even if it might benefit one value at the expense of another. Are you um, saying that we should not be operating at 757? Because I think we have an agreement there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I would have to confer with my team and get back to you, but I, I feel fairly comfortable saying we would agree with that. Uh, okay. Another yeah. moment, uh, everyone. Please. <laughs> yeah, I think it's happening. Yeah. Um, and I think I had another question, but I've lost it. So I think that's all I had for now. Okay. Um, Bob has a question, Lester. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, just one question. I'm, I'm having some trouble understanding the logic of these comparisons. You say... What, that, the, that nature's impact is hundreds of times greater or, or whatever than, than the things within the operational range. Do I think from that then, that if we can imagine a flood in the year or whatever that would cause more impact than impacts due to the operations of the reservoir, then, then any impacts that occur due to the operations of the reservoir are, are immaterial or, or don't matter. 
because eventually a flood's going to come along and overwhelm them. Is that what I'm hearing? I, I'm a little bit unclear. Could could we try that once again? And I, I apologize. No, no problem. It was, maybe it was a little bit muddled. So, so you're you're putting a extreme amount of emphasis on how much greater the impacts are, how much greater the impacts of the natural floods are or of nature compared to, uh, you know, th things that happen within the ability to operate the reservoir. But we are showing impacts of those, albeit smaller, there are impacts due to the operations of the reservoir. And so my question is, is part of your point to say, eventually we're gonna get a big flood that will overwhelm any of the things that could be affected by the operations of the reservoir and therefore those smaller things due to operations of the reservoir make no difference. That's kind of what I'm hearing you saying when you emphasize that. I just don't understand that. Okay, I think I think at this point I have a better understanding of the question. And you know, I'm an engineer and I'm, you know, here to run HECRAS models and analyze the results of HECRAS models and what the mathematical results of the models are showing us is that nature has a significantly greater impact on the water surface elevations than um, GRDA. And I, I think in that question, there was a little bit of, of a reversal of saying uh, we, are, we are focusing on, on things. But the, if I'm focusing on anything, I'm focusing on the magnitude of the results. My job here is to run the simulations requested by FERC and to report the results. And the scientific results that we have here show that the impact of nature is much greater than the impact of operations. And I also want to clarify, I, I know I've said this a number of times today, but I think it's very important when you're looking at those differences in maximum water surface elevation, the core is in control. The GRDA is not in control. And I believe the process here is to focus on how do GRDA's operations um, impact things, not, not how the core's flood control uh, impacts things. So I, I, know, I, I know I'm not directly answering your question there, but does that, does that information help? Well, I would, I would say no, and, and respectfully, um, I see your numbers, and you're saying I'm just presenting the numbers. There are many ways of defining impact. So you have apparently one definition of impact. If we look at just the, the, the water surface elevations as an example, you're comparing it, you know, if it goes up by 0.1 foot for some of your lower operations and the 100 year flood is 20, then it's, you know, it's 2000 times greater. Okay, that's fine. Um, and that's right. Like, yeah, uh, I, I want to pause there. Can excuse me, let me that, right? just finish what I was saying. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so you're just presenting the numbers, but you are emphasizing things in a way that is sending a strong message about your interpretation of those numbers. So it's not, it's not fair to just say, I'm just an engineer, I'm just giving you the numbers. I, I'll leave it at that, I'm sorry. Okay, but it's, it's, yeah, I do want to clarify though that it's not an interpretation of numbers. Um, because I can't look at the number two and we can't have Chuck and Walker and others look at the number two, and one of us says it's three, and one of us says it's one. Uh, these numbers, like the one we see on the screen here, where we show that nature, uh, the impact of nature ranges from 42 to 223 times greater than this anticipated operational range. Those, like you said, and that's why, and I apologize for interrupting, but I wanted to focus on what we could agree on. Those come from quantifications of the model. So this quantification is built on other quantifications. It's just a mathematical formula. It's not an interpretation. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Walker and Kevin Stubbs have their hands raised, so we'll go with Kevin. Okay. Yeah, is your your duration is that hours 
that it's at that peak elevation? Is that what you're measuring? Yeah, so uh, we covered the de definition of duration earlier, I'm, and it's, I'm more than happy to remind everyone of, of what that is. And I pulled up a table here. Uh, yes to the first part, these, the numbers that we are presenting, um, like in this table here, are in hours. And these are differences. And so when we define duration, um, if we are within the flow adjustment, we are looking at the time that the water surface elevation is outside the flow adjustment, or I'm, I'm sorry, above the flow adjustment. And um, when we are outside of the flow adjustment, then we are looking at out of bank. And that's how we are defining these. Okay. Because we can't really say time at peak because peak is one instant in time. Right. Uh, at least for our purposes for looking at effects to say, you know, wildlife habitat or threatened or endangered species, kind of, I, I guess the duration we would be interested in is the duration. It's actually in the still in the flood pool or duration that it's you know inundating. Uh, Portions that of the stream that would not normally be inundated. Okay, and when we talk about what typically is or isn't inundated, you know, we have to remember that um, during baseline operations, we have a seasonal rule curve. And now when we're looking at anticipated operations, we have a, a you know, flexible pool between 742 and 745. So always we're going to have areas that are inundated or are not inundated as that, as those levels fluctuate. And so, you know, this kind of gets back to the previous question in, in a little way that math mathematically we need to come up with a definition of inundation of duration that works in our entire model domain. And for most of our model domain, the, the flooding, um, or the, I'm sorry, the flow adjustment um, uh, services quite well. And, and when not, you know, out of bank is, is a great engineering definition. Okay, well, maybe this discussion can continue when we're looking at the terrestrial and uh, other studies. I, yeah, probably that probably is the time to have that discussion. Thank you for the question, Kevin. Okay, um, we'll go to Walker next. All right. Walker? Yeah, yes, thanks. So, you know, going back to something Chuck said a minute ago that GRDA had put a lot of time and effort into, uh, that's probably my paraphrase, into developing the anticipated operations scenario. Um, you know, admittedly, I still have more work to do in digesting these reports, but I was hoping you could direct us to, if that's presented anywhere, kind of, how, how those were developed and how the factors were balanced, because uh, so far I haven't come across that. That was in our, uh, if I remember right, uh, in our filing in late December of last year, Walker. Section, uh, I can't remember the section, so I'm not even going to try. Towards the beginning of the document. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, that's it for me. Okay, we have... Uh... Guy Thomas, you have a hand raised again. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm looking at um, slide 44. And say, for these simulations, say for the July 2007, is this the actual recorded flood you're modeling, or is this the simulated one from the operations model or from the riverway model? So this has to be a simulated from the operations model um, inflow because we are modifying the starting elevation. Okay, but as I recall, the two thousand say for the two thousand and seven flood, it was really it was under predicting the duration for the um, yeah I think the the hydrograph was really under predicting the actual conditions by, by up to a couple of weeks. Is that correct? 
I, I'm sorry, what model are you referring to? Uh, I th the, say for the, the um, slide 44, July 2007, and I think in the operations model, uh, it may have been figure six or so, that the predicted hydrograph was under predicting the stage hydrographs of the actual conditions by, by a, a large amount and for a couple of weeks. So, Jesse, the two yeah, go ahead, Ryan. So, this is Ryan again. I, I understand um, that there is a difference, Di, between the observed hydrographs, what actually happened during that event, versus what was modeled based on the flood routing rules. But again, in order to have a comparative simulation, in order to assess the difference between different starting elevations, we have to have a modelable set of flood routing rules. This goes back to the whole point of why we developed the operations model. So you can't really fairly compare what happened in the observed event versus happen, you know, what happened in one of the modeled events, uh, because you, you can't take the observed event and start it with different elevations and see what happens. In order to do that, you have to model it. So is, is there another follow-up question you'd like to ask? No, I'm just trying to put, you know, try and put it in context in my own head. If you've got a difference of three hours, say at River Mile 134 or 135, what would it be? What would be actual, if you'd model the actual conditions? How much would that change? And what I'm hearing you say, you know, you can't give me an answer on that because you didn't model the actual 2007 flood. You just had to use the one from the operations model. Well, Ryan, you can respond if you want. But yeah, this again, we are following. Di, you've got to remember, we are following the FERC study plan here. Ryan did that with his operations model, right? We're using the riverware validation. FERC requested um, additional work from Ryan. He performed that work. And I just, for, for the remainder of the audience, I don't want to leave that unfair characterization hanging because we no, have to compare. A... Hold on. We have to compare apples to apples here. And, and what we're doing is we are using our models modifying the starting elevation in accordance with FERC study plan determination and running in flows through those models and then making comparisons. So number one, we're doing everything in accordance with FERC's determination. Number two, we're doing it um, in a way that um, is, is a technically sound approach. And so I, I really can't let that stand. No, well, it's fine. My, you've answered my question, which was, I wanted to just clarify that you're using the 2007 flood from the operations model and not the actual conditions. So that's all I'm asking. Yeah. And, okay. and, and I think that I would say that once we have actual conditions on the ground, that's where the core makes decisions based on real world, a, a real world scenario as it's unfolding. So I think that part of the reason that why you, you're hearing from us that we don't think it's a really fair question is that in the real world, decisions are gonna be made that's informed by river wear, but also informed by other factors as well. And so the model at the beginning of the scenario may very well say that they're going to keep grant up for a long period of time, but if the storm doesn't happen the way that they predict, or if other factors happen in other parts of this very complex system, that might change. And, and because of that, the only, real way that we can accurately um, understand these issues is through an apples to apples comparison in the model. Well, thanks. I think we've taken this way beyond what I asked. Um, and I think you've answered my initial question of that you use the operations model 2007 flood and not the actual conditions. That's all I'm asking. Okay, and again, to close it out, you know, we followed the FERC uh, approved study plan, and I understand that you're, you know, you would like to see something different than the FERC approved study plan. No, I'm not asking that at all. I, okay, I'm going to just leave that one alone. Do we have uh, questions for Walker? No. Okay. So this is Brian Edwards. I think now is probably a good time to go ahead and break for lunch because the next piece of material will go a little longer. So let's do that. And uh, we'll
start back at the scheduled time. Which is 1.30.
All right, everybody, welcome back. We're going to finish up H and H. Jesse, the floor is yours. All right, I'm going to need to go quickly here. Uh, we are behind time, but we'll look at some graphical results for the UHM. <clears throat> First of all, these are the plots for the September 1993, aka the 21-year inflow event. Um, you can see on the x-axis here, uh, we are focusing on River Mile 130 to 140. This is right around the area of the city of Miami. The full set of plots for the Neosho and the other rivers are included um, in the report. Um, you can see on our left axis here and all the colored lines are maximum water surface elevations. And on the right side of the axis, we are looking at maximum difference in water surface elevation. Those are the two dotted lines. So you can see on this plot, we have, uh, for example, start at 734, plotted as that solid purple line. That is, you know, if we start the water surface elevation of the reservoir at 734, and a 21 year inflow event moves through the system, what is the water, resulting water surface elevation profile going to look like? We do that so on and so forth up to 757. On the right axis, again, as I said, those are the difference plots. So the gray line is for the extreme hypothetical range. So that is more or less comparing the 734 to 757 range. And then the dotted black line that you can see very close to zero there, but it'll probably be hard to see in some of these plots, is the difference within GRDA's anticipated operational range. Again, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the core is in control for these maximum water surface elevations that you're seeing right here. So this is September 1993. This is the water surface elevations. Here is the inundation extent. So uh, where you can't see any differentiation at all between the colors, that is because all of the inundation extents are virtually coincident for 734 feet PD all the way up to and including 757 feet PD. So we kind of rinse and repeat here on some of the um, other inflow events. So uh, the June 2004 event, this is the one year event. Um, similarly, you know, all, all the characteristics of this plot are the same. What we are now plotting is a different inflow event. Then you can see the map for the June 2004 inundation extents. Here you see the July 2007 profiles. Here you see the July 2007, aka four year maximum inundation extents. Then we have the three year or the October 2009 profiles. You'll notice again that that black dotted line continues to be very low along the X axis. Um, and I did, I, I'm sorry, I meant to mention when I talked about the one year event that that is the event that for GRD's anticipated operational range, we are inside the flow adjustment for these other ones, um, the core is in control. So here's the, again, the October 2009, AKA three year. Here's the uh, map of the three year. And then here we have December 2015, a.k.a. 15-year. And then finally, uh, we have the 100-year event. Um, you can see the dot lines virtually at the zero um, there on the, on the right axis. And again, inundation extents are virtually identical, regardless of the starting elevation from 734 feet PD all the way up to 757 feet PD. Now let's look at things, uh, let's look at the historical starting stage water surface elevation profiles. So here, the various colored lines that are plotted against the x-axis are various historical inflow events. We have the one year, the three year, 15 year, the 21 year, um, and the four year as well uh, on this plot. The dotted black line here is something different. This is no longer the impact of the starting stage within GRDA's anticipated operational range. Now the black dotted line represents the maximum impact of nature for these historical inflow events. So you can see on this plot how the impact of nature 
is in you know much much greater, I would say orders of magnitude as we say in the report and as we've discussed today, uh, greater than that operational range has an impact. Similarly, here are the maps, and you can see you know before looking at those maps, you can barely see any differentiation between the color. Now we have a lot of differentiation between the color. Now let's look at those same historical inflow events, but let's look at all of them with a starting elevation of 734 feet PD. And now because we are not using the historical starting stages, we can add in the 100 year flow again event. So the colored lines are the different natural uh, inflow events and the dotted black line, which is there up around 30 feet of water surface elevation difference. That is the difference between those plotted lines. So here's the map for 734. Again, you can see this vast difference in inundation extent. This, this hammers home the impact that nature has on the system. We can do the same thing for 742 feet. So this is a starting water surface elevation of 742 feet for all of those plots. Here is the map for that. So this is at the bottom of GRD's anticipated operational range. You can see the vast impact that nature has. And again, here at 745 feet PD, we continue to see the vast impact of nature at the top of GRD's anticipated operational range. Again, that 30 feet of water surface elevation difference that nature can have. And here's the map for 745. And then lastly, we have the 757, both the water surface elevation plots and the inundation extents. I have one more comparison uh, that I'd like to look at before we move on. That is this comparison of maximum water surface elevation differences. So all of these dotted lines shown, they are no longer, we, we're not looking at any sort of water surface elevations on these plots at all. We are only looking at water surface elevation differences, which were on the right axis previously, but now we're on the left axis. Here we see that top blue line, that's the impact of nature if you include the 100 year event. And you can see that that line goes above 30 feet throughout the city of Miami. Uh, that just speaks to the incredible impact that nature can have on inundation and water surface elevation, or I should just say water surface elevations in the city of Miami. The orange line is if you remove the 100 year, um, the gray line is the impact that the starting stage range of 23 feet, that extreme hypothetical range can have on the water surface elevations. And I don't know if anyone can see it on team or on the, on the call, but the black line that is basically hovering right along the zero axis is the impact of GRD's anticipated operational range. And again, I need to remind everyone that while that's GRDA's anticipated operational range, the core is in control for that uh, minuscule um, you know, value and difference of water surface elevation that you see right there. So in summary, regarding the graphical results that we've looked at, the magnitude of the natural inflow event is the primary determining factor of maximum water surface elevation. The starting pool elevations within GRDA's anticipated operational range have an immaterial impact on upstream water surface elevations. And even at extreme hypothetical values of starting pool elevations outside GRDA's anticipated operational range are used, the impact of nature is much greater than that of a 23-foot change in starting pool elevation. None of these conclusions should be surprising to anyone considering what we talked about before lunch with the orders of magnitude differences. And with that, on the graphical analysis, uh, I'll take any questions before moving on to anticipated operational analysis. I don't see any hands raised, so you can carry on. Okay. So for the anticipated operations, um, just a brief reminder that we are looking at GRDA maintaining a pool between 742 and 745 feet PD for purposes of normal hydropower operation, and the GRDA will continue to adhere to the Army Corps of Engineers direction on flood control ops in accordance with the water control manual. Ryan presented this earlier in the operations model presentation. 
but just a reminder on what we are simulating in this suite of simulations that we are looking at for anticipated operations. We are looking at the full range. We are looking at everything down to a one-year inflow event, everything up to a 100-year inflow event. We are looking at the top of FERC's requested uh, starting stage range of 757. We're also looking down at the bottom at 734. We're doing this for both baseline and to, uh, baseline operations and anticipated operations. And I'll, I'll speak on the next slide a little bit more on the July 2007, aka the four-year inflow event. Uh, but I want to put these words up on the screen so you can see them. So as I said, we're simulating with both baseline and anticipated operations. And this suite, again, as I just said, represents the minimum and maximum starting pool elevations requested by FERC the smallest and largest inflow events requested by FERC, and in regard to the July 2007, an event of historical importance to the upstream communities. That event is within the studied range of starting pool elevations. It is within the studied range of inflow magnitudes, and the starting pool elevation is based on the period of record simulation, that's 2004 to 2019, using either baseline or anticipated operations representing realistic starting elevations based on these antecedent conditions and operating rules. Therefore, the, the simulations that we are looking at of the July 2007 inflow event are the most integrous comparisons of anticipated operations as compared to baseline operations that we are looking at. The results show that anticipated operations have an immaterial impact on wa upstream water surface elevations as compared to baseline operations. Um, when we're looking at this table here, you can see on the left, my left column is the simulation, and on the right side, that is, it says maximum increase in water surface elevation due to anticipated operations. I would like to mention that this is for all locations at all rivers. So this is a, a distilled table. So you can see when we say 0.00, .00 for both of those June 2004 events, baseline versus anticipated, we're talking about 0.00, .00 on the Neosho, on the Spring, on the Elk, and on Tar Creek. For the July 2007, or the four-year inflow event, with that period of record starting pool elevation, that most integrous uh, simulation that we were just discussing, the maximum increase in water surface elevation throughout the entire UHM is 0 0.02 feet. <clears throat> And that maximum occurs on the Elk River. If you only look at the Neosho River, which is of importance to the stakeholders here, the maximum increase is 0.01 feet. Uh, for the 100-year event, starting at 734, we have 0.05, which occurs on the Spring River. The max increase on the Neosho is 0.03, or three hundredths of a foot. And again, for 100-year with 757, the difference between baseline and anticipated, all rivers in the system, 0.0. .0. I'm going to graphically show some things, um, but there isn't much to see here because the lines are basically plotted on top of each other. So the blue line that you can see, there's actually a purple line under it. This is 757 starting elevation for the June 2004 event, both with baseline and anticipated operations. The yellowish orangish line you see, there's another line under it. It's a red line. Again, that's, that's 734 for baseline and anticipated. Um, and the dotted lines that are basically along the zero on the right axis there are the differences because we just tabularly showed that the differences are 0.0, .0 for the June 2004 event. Uh, we're just showing this graphically in the city of Miami. Next up for that July 2007 four year inflow event, um, you can see that again, baseline and anticipated operations are virtually identical, uh, also denoted by the dotted line that's along the zero um, of the right axis there. <clears throat> Similarly, for the 100 year, um, you have the 734 and 757 baseline and anticipated, uh, virtually zero difference between them. Moving on to a discussion of inundation maps in regard to the anticipated operations results. Based on these maximum water surface elevation results, no new additional maps were created. So a difference in inundation extent 
for a difference in water surface elevation of five hundredths of a foot or less at a few discrete locations cannot be effectively displayed on a map. So the extent of inundation for the anticipated operations is virtually identical to the extent of inundation for the baseline operations. That is why we are not creating new maps for this at all. Looking at duration, uh, you will see there that it's mostly zeros across the board, except for the 100 year event for 734 and 757. And those increases in duration occur at River Mile 129, and it's in a uh, rural, spark, uh, sparsely populated area. And that two hour increase in duration is isolated to this location. Are there any questions uh, on anticipated operations before I move on to the discussion of the supporting analyses for other studies? Yes, Walker has his hand, hand raised, Walker. Yes, uh, and this, this actually goes, oh, uh, goes back to a um, discussion with Chuck before the break as well, um, where I had asked sort of for, you know, a reminder of where the anticipated operations came from, and Chuck had mentioned all the work GRDA has done to evaluate and balance interests, and I asked, you know, where's that documented? Um, he said it was in the, I, I think, the December 29th filing late last year, and so I pulled that up, and I think what I'm seeing is section 1.6.2, entirely on page 12 of that report, which sort of asserts that GRDA has weighed those options, and then it says GRDA, quote, has determined that the following operational parameters will apply during the new license term, and then it lists four operational parameters. That's all I'm immediately finding as to reporting on where these parameters came from. But if I'm missing that and there is some more analysis of how uh, you know, what options were evaluated or how interests were weighed, I'd appreciate being directed to that. Uh, that's all I had. So your question is directly regarding the interests that were weighed? My question is whether there's anything in the reports other than that one page in the December filing that explains uh, the weighing that Chuck said GRDA has engaged in and the work to balance interests to generate the anticipated operation. So that's the only place, Walker, that I'm aware of, of where we explain what the new operations will be. But what you see, and you're starting to see um, in even the presentations now, and this will continue over the next couple of days, is we've used those operations in evaluating uh, the uh, the, the resource areas that we were asked to uh, evaluate under the FERC study plan. Um, and then that is the, uh, the, the, certainly the draft and then the final license application will include the kind of effects analysis, if you will, of GRDA's proposed analysis, uh, proposed action related to uh, these you know, operational changes that we're anticipating. I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. I just don't see anything that kind of explains any more, like you said, about where those uh, par operational parameters came from. So I understand that, you know, you'll apply them and say what you think the impacts are within the framework of those parameters. But um, I don't – anyway, I, yes, I, I think I understand what there is to see here. Thank you. Thank you. I do not see any other questions, so you can carry on. Okay. Now I'll be discussing supporting analyses for other studies. So analyses were conducted in support of four studies, the aquatic species, terrestrial species, wetland and riparian habitat, and sedimentation. I'll discuss those in turn. So the natural resources teams uh, requested comparisons between anticipated and baseline operations during normal operations and inflows. Analysis of normal operations and inflows is necessary for biological assessments. So let's first discuss the aquatic species study. Um, we performed simulations to assess the impact to specific uh, aquatic species. We used both baseline and anticipated operations. And again, we looked at that 2004 to 2019 period of record and the simulations of that period of record. Uh, we looked at the uh, critical time period as defined by the aquatic study team. So this is seasonality or timing. So this is kind of the fourth element 
uh, responding to FERC's approved study plan, uh, what we need to look at. We need to look at um, inundation extents. We need to look at uh, amplitude or water surface elevation. We need to look at duration and then timing or um, you know seasonality. And that, that is uh, this fourth component. So for the aquatic species study, the critical time period was May 15 to July 8. And uh, we simulated normal or median operational levels and inflows during that critical time period for the uh, 2004 to 2019 period of record. We also looked at the maximum inundation as required by the revised study plan. So we looked at that period of record. We looked at all the major events during that period of record, which were the July 2007, December 2015, April 2017, and May 2019 events. And we simulated those. After uh, we got done simulating those, we looked at the maximum inundation boundaries and merged them together into a single inundation boundary. Uh, we found that the maximum inundation for baseline and anticipated operations was virtually identical. So maps showing these components, one being the anticipated operations and baseline operations, um, inundation extents for normal operations, and then also the maximum inundation. Those two, uh, or those three things rather, were mapped, and we provided these maps to the aquatic species study team. Similarly, for the terrestrial species study, um, we looked at uh, simulations required to assess the impact of terrestrial species. Um, the same parameters as before applied um, with the critical time period. Again, this is the timing component required by FERC um, being January 1 to December 31 as defined by that study team. We also, once again, mapped the maximum inundation, which is the same maximum inundation as before, um, because that is, again, it's for the whole period of record. It's for those uh, large flow events that occurred. So we then uh, look, we created maps uh, showing areas of potential lentic and loaded conversion and we provided those to the terrestrial species study team. Finally, for natural resources, we did the same thing for uh, wetlands and riparian habitat study with their critical time period being March 30 to November 2. And we provided uh, those maps showing potential wetland and riparian inundation changes to the wetland and riparian habitat study team. Finally, and you'll hear a lot more about this tomorrow, is uh, work we did with the sedimentation study um, first and foremost, we followed the Commission's May 27, 2022 determination regarding the sedimentation study. We used a 1D version of the UHM to simulate the July 2007 or the four-year historical inflow event and the 100-year inflow event. We looked at starting reservoir elevations of 740, 745, and 750, all in accordance with the Commission's determination. We simulated scenarios to understand the effects of project operation and predicted channel geometry changes on upstream water surface elevations. And the operations model was used to calculate the downstream stage hydrographs at Pensacola Dam in support of that effort. We received our geometry files from the sedimentation study team. And uh, I'll finally say that the results of all that analysis will be discussed tomorrow in the sedimentation study presentation and they're also documented in the sedimentation study report. Any questions on the supporting analysis that we performed for other studies before I move on to conclusions? Uh, yes, we have one question from Kevin Stubbs. Kevin? <clears throat> yeah, um, how did you choose these time frames, and or who was on your study teams? Um, the, some of the terrestrial effects, I, I assume the, the time frame you picked was looking for flooding effects on caves, but um, you have <clears throat> at least two different you know, listed bat species that are using the timber during the summer, and so the critical time for those species is really the pup season. So, you know, you wouldn't want to flood trees when they, you know, couldn't fly. So I don't know if I agree with your, your time periods. 
if you're doing this to prepare a biological assessment anyway. Okay, I, I do understand the question and I would just like to say that um, we are simply in at this presentation right now documenting uh, the information received from the natural resources and sedimentation study teams and we are running those simulations in our um, upstream hydraulic model. Um, so I would say I think that question is probably best saved for a later time and where I think it can be fully discussed. Okay. And, and that, that'll be tomorrow. Okay. Any other questions, Jeffrey? No. Okay. All right. Finally, we will discuss our conclusions. Um, none of this should be a surprise. We've touched on most of this already. This is just a summary of our conclusions. Uh, the starting pool elevations at Pensacola Dam within GRDA's anticipated operational range have an immaterial impact on upstream water surface elevations, inundation, and duration. Only natural inflows and not project operation cause an appreciable impact on maximum water surface elevations, inundation extent, or duration of inundation. And those differences in those three factors due to the size of the inflow event were orders of magnitude greater than the differences due to the initial stage at Pensacola Dam. The maximum impact of nature ranged from over 10 to over 100 or even 1,000 times the maximum simulated impact of GRDA's anticipated operations. Even if an extreme hypothetical starting pool range of 23 feet was used, um, the, that 23-foot range um, is, is uh, or rather the impact of nature is going to be much greater than that 23-foot range. The impact of nature ranged from two times to 10 times or even 100 times the impact of that extreme hypothetical range, again, going from 734 feet PD up to 757, a range of 23 feet. Comparing uh, anticipated operations to baseline operations, for a suite of simulations that span the FERC requested range of starting pool elevations and inflow event magnitudes, the results of the UHM demonstrate that anticipated operations have an immaterial impact on upstream water surface elevations, inundation, and duration of inundation as compared to baseline operations. And finally, all conclusions on potential lentic and loaded conversion areas are discussed in each of the individual biological assessment reports. And with that, uh, I'll take any final questions, but that's the conclusion of the UHM presentation. Kevin? Yeah, um, I'm sure it may all be discussed, like you said, tomorrow, but um, you, you seem to be focusing potentially on the, the wrong subject. You know, your starting elevation changes even if they were minor, the inundation levels were still talking about, you know, differences of, let's say, hundreds of acres to potentially thousands of acres in some cases. And, you know, like I said, the baths that are using the timber, if you're flooding hundreds of acres, you, you, you have additional acres, even if it's minor to the comparison of nature, you're, you still have a potential for take. And so when you're doing your biological assessment, I mean, really for compliance with ESA, you know, you, you should be consulting and trying to get, you know, an incidental take permit for those differences. You shouldn't be trying to argue that they don't exist just because they're minor compared the, the effects of nature. I don't, you know, I just want to see the, the actual, you know, data, and we can deal with that in the consultation, but it's not appropriate, even if they are minor, to essentially say they don't exist. 
I think someone else has something to say, but I, I also have, go, go ahead, ahead, Jesse. Go ahead first, if you want. Okay. Um, I, I, I understand the question, <laughs> and I would like to reiterate that when we're talking about differences, uh, we are talking about when the Army Corps is in control and we're in flood control operations, not when GRD is in control. And um, we, we have to put the study results. I mean, the numbers are coming out of the model, and we have to put them in some sort of context here. And and the orders of magnitude, I think, is a very helpful context that we have. To to the point of, you know, we need to see the numbers. Um, we have done our best here to provide quantifications that will give both technical people and laypersons an accurate understanding of what is occurring in the system. And also, according to or in accordance with FERC's determination. We've provided the model uh, inputs and outputs to the stakeholders. So if anyone uh, wants to do their own analysis of anything, whether it be inundation extent or water surface elevations, you know, everyone's welcome to do that. Uh, Kevin, this is Sean Pusen for Mead and Hunt. Um, I'll be helping um, develop the draft license application. And I kind of, if correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you may be, when you're talking about roosting or pup season um, in the trees, uh, I think you may be referring primarily to northern long-eared bat um, and specifically in the study plan determination, we were asked to evaluate the effects on uh, gray bats. And although in the license application, we will, we will talk about uh, northern long ear bats in the license application. Um, we did not do a specific study for um, anything other than gray bats. Um, and um, the other thing that I think you hopefully understand is um, Jesse is, is presenting the upstream H and H model, and his analysis was a year round timing or seasonality for American burying beetles. The analysis that was done for the gray bats is a little bit different because we were looking at percentage of time that water would be entering the hibernation, the caves, um, and percentage of time that um, the caves would be closed off, and then also looking at the effectiveness of the new exit. And that analysis actually was presented by Ryan much earlier today as part of the operations analysis. Um, so just because <coughs> Jesse didn't give the timing um, for all of the terrestrial species, that doesn't mean we didn't look at that. That was looked at as part of a different study because of the way the models work. Well, you have northern longhorn bats, and we just proposed the tricolored bat for listing. And so... You know, both okay. of those species could be could be using the timbered areas and uh, could be affected by flooding, and, and all of those bat species could be in a cave. You know, during the winter, but during the summer, there's at least two of those species would be potentially using the timbered areas near the project. So that that should be a part of your part of your assessment for for potential yep. risk. Potential take. Yep, and uh, you know, be patient with us. The the H and H study is, or the comprehensive hydraulic model is for for primarily looking at water flows, not assessing uh, impact to the uh, listed species. So we will take care of that in the um, draft license application. What we're talking about right now are the specific studies that are pieces that go into the analyses that are done in the draft license application. Okay. Do you have anything else, Kevin, before I move to darker comments? Well, I mean, just the, you know, frequency and inundation levels affect, you know, all the terrestrial and aquatic habitat. You know, as well as for habitat for some of these species, so that that should all be, you know, addressed in looking at impacts and potential mitigation options. 
Okay. Thank you. Di, would you like to proceed with your questions? Yeah, thanks. Uh, could you just go back to, I think, slide 94? And I just want to... Oh, uh, I just want to check that that first statement, you say GRDA's anticipated operational have an immaterial impact. Okay. No, I'm sorry, I thought I read the word appreciable before and I just wanted to check the difference between, well, maybe you said appreciable and meant immaterial. Um, no. so, thanks for that. I, th I think I've answered my own question there and I, I'll move on. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hey, Di, if you could start doing more of that, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> Answering your own questions. You do a much better job of that than we do. The answers are much shorter, at least. <laughs> okay, um, Kevin and Di, if you'll remove your hands so I know that your questions are answered, that'd be great. Walker? Uh, yes, sadly, I found the word appreciable that Di was asking about. It's in number two there on that slide. So... And I think the question was whether immaterial is going to mean anything different than appreciable, or is it two words for sort of the same standard? I think I would say here, Walker, that I, I've really done my best to not just, I mean, we as the tech team have provided quantifications. We've discussed those at length today. I don't know what else I can say that's going to convince you specifically that the dam had, or the, I'm sorry, that the anticipated operational range has an immaterial impact. I, I think we just got to leave it at that. Well, that. That really wasn't my question. It's just because appreciable means something different. Yeah, I, I think we've answered that question the best that we can, Walker. We're going to move on. Very good, thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions from anyone else before we close out the upstream model? Okay. Next step. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, I'm going to get, uh, as Nick Hathaway comes up here to present the uh, DHM, I'm just pulling his uh, deck up. So thank you, everyone. Hello everyone, um, I'm Nick Hathaway with Meet Hunt, um, and today I'll be talking about the downstream hydraulic model. Jesse just talked about the upstream hydraulic model, and this model, um, the downstream hydraulic model covers the area from Pensacola Dam through Lake Hudson down to Kerr Dam. Quick outline of what we'll talk about, we'll, we'll quickly go through the h, &H study objectives to remind everyone what we're going for here. Uh, we'll talk about the FERC determination. Then we'll talk about the specific downstream hydraulic model objectives. We'll go through the simulated scenarios, the study results, discuss those results, and then get to conclusions. So just a quick recap on the h, &H study's objectives. Um, number one there you can see is to analyze the inundation, in our case, downstream of Pensacola Dam, and that's what we'll be focusing on for this presentation. Under the current license operations of the project during several measure inflow events, to provide those model results in a format that can inform other analyses. And then lastly, to determine the feasibility of implementing any anticipated future operations that GRDA may propose as part of this for licensing. So you've seen this figure um, before, Jesse showed it for the upstream hydraulic model, but I do want to kind of focus in again on, on what's happening here. So we have the operations model that uh, Ryan presented on earlier this morning. It's the same sort of situation for the downstream hydraulic model. The operations model feeds results into the downstream hydraulic model, uh, which are used for inputs for that hydraulic model. Um, and the results of that model, um, the DHM that is, then feed into any other studies. And whenever I say DHM, by the way, I'm referring to the downstream hydraulic model. I'll get into the FERC determination here. Um, first off, um, I'll say that uh, 
overwhelmingly, it seems that the, uh, the FERC was um, in agreement with what we did for the ISR, but they, they did have some recommendations specific to the downstream hydraulic model that I'll be discussing here today. Um, I'll mention here also that we're not discussing anything that was um, discussed during the ISR and that FERC has already ruled upon, so we're discussing specifically the final study season here. Um, not the first study season or anything that's been rolled on there. Um, so item number one there is to run the inflow event scenarios at starting reservoir elevations for Pensacola Dam from 734 feet PD up to 757 feet PD. And I do want to pause on this for a second. So whenever I discuss um, starting reservoir elevations, I'm referring to starting reservoir elevations or starting pool elevations at Pensacola Dam. Yes, we're modeling downstream of Pensacola Dam for this part of the study. But um, I will always be referencing starting pool elevations of Pensacola Dam. Uh, second there is to report the frequency, timing, amplitude, i.e. elevation, and duration for each of the simulated inflow events with those same, same starting stage elevations. Uh, this slide here just covers how we met those um, goals of the approved study plan and FERC's determination. Number one there, we did um, simulate the inflow event scenarios with starting reservoir elevations at Pensacola Dam, remember, for 734 feet PD, up to including 757 feet PD. Uh, for frequency of the inflow events, we reported that as the return period for the inflow events, and that's included in the report and in all the appendices. We can try to um, smatter it throughout our um, report there. Um, and as far as timing goes, that originates in the RSP, and it does refer to the seasonality of inflow to the Pensacola Dam and inundation from the upstream um, hydraulic model, or UHM. Amplitude was reported uh, as water surface elevations throughout the report and its appendices. And then lastly, duration of inundation is reported. Next, I'll get into the more specifics of the downstream hydraulic model objectives. On the left there, you can see what we completed for study season one. Again, we're not focusing during this presentation on those items, but that, was, that covered uh, DHM development the DHM calibration, and then our initial simulated scenarios. But what we are focusing on here is the final study season, or what we reported in the USR. I will uh, mention that everything that's discussed in that uh, left column that is sort of grayed out is still discussed in the USR, but we're not going to be covering it during today's presentation. But as what was done for the final study season included um, any uh, revised simulations um, for um, the scenarios we need to look at, and then um, providing study results and discussion, looking at anticipated operations analysis, and then also conclusions. More specifics on the simulated scenarios. This should look very familiar to what you see, had seen from Jesse's presentation. Um, on the left column in this table are the various info events we analyzed. The first five are historical info events, meaning they occurred in the past. Um, in the bottom, the 100-year event, this is a synthetic event um, that we derived. I do want to focus your attention on the column there that's titled Estimated Return Period for Peak Inflow to Pensacola Dam. That is the return period for inflows to Pensacola Dam. Um, again, everything is in reference to um, what is coming into um, Pensacola Dam. So those recurrence intervals are the same recurrence intervals that are reported in the UHM as well. And then lastly, we have the simulation start and end dates specific to the uh, DHM. This table should also look familiar. It basically summarizes the various scenarios we ran with each of the events uh, with different starting stages at Pensacola Dam. We did break it out into two different categories again. So we have the anticipated operational range from 742 to 745, where we looked at starting pools at half a foot increments between that range. And then we have the extreme hypothetical range for starting pools outside of GRA's anticipated operational range. Those range from 734 feet PD up to 757 feet PD. Before I get into study results, I'm just going to take a quick break and see if anyone has any questions out there. None so far. Okay, okay cool. <clears throat> So I'll first go through what exactly we reported as results. Um, I'll say here that um, all these results are included in detail in the appendices for our USR. So if you want to look at the, the numbers and dissect them however you want, they are all there. Uh, we did provide tabular results that compare the max water surface elevations through the DHM for each event with various starting stages of Pensacola Dam. 
We did two different comparisons for those um, max water surface elevations. Uh, one being using starting stages at Pensacola Dam within the anticipated operational range. So that's between 742 and 745 feet PD. And then the second being um, comparison for starting stages that included the extreme hypothetical values that are outside of GRD's anticipated range. So that's from 734 feet PD up to 757 feet PD. We also did a comparison of the max water surface elevations for the historical starting stages for each of the inflow events, essentially um, analyzing the, the impact of the magnitude of the inflow event. We also provided the results in, as graphical water surface profiles and provided similar comparisons with those as the tabular results. Uh, we looked at duration of inundation. Similar to um, the UHM, uh, we defined the time of uh, the duration of inundation as the time of inundation above the flow achievement for the, in this case, the Markham Ferry Hydro Project or um, the Lake Hudson Hydro Project. Uh, this flow achievement is defined by the Corps of Engineers and varies from elevation 637.5 near Kerr Dam up to elevation 658 near uh, just downstream of Pensacola Dam, and those elevations are in NGV. We provided the same comparisons as the tabular results when looking at this duration of inundation. We also provided inundation maps that show the maximum inundation extents throughout the study area for the DHM with the same comparisons again as the tabular results. This is an example of one of those inundation maps. This um, location in particular is just downstream of Pensacola Dam and is for the June 2004 or the one year event. You can see the rainbow of colors representing the simulation results for the uh, various starting stages at Pensacola Dam, ranging from 734 feet PD all the way up to 757 feet PD. This is a similar example plot, this time showing the historical starting stage simulations, or in other words, the different inflow events compared against each other with their historical starting stages. So you can see the various colors representing the various inflow events ranging from the one-year event, which is the June 2004 event, all the way up to the 21-year event, which is the September 1993 event. Similar to the, the UHM, uh, we looked at differences in inundation areas in the downstream hydraulic model. You can see this table here shows the, this both the smallest and the largest inundation area for the events that were simulated with starting stages within GRDA's anticipated operational range. And those are in acres in those um, middle columns with the percent difference up on the right. So for the first six rows, those are for each of the events that were simulated with, within GRDA's anticipated operational range. And then that last row represents the comparison of the various inflow events compared against each other with historical starting stage. Um, and that would be essentially the impact of nature. Um, you can see that there is a, quite a difference between the um, impact of nature and the percent difference of the various inflow events with different starting stages, which team GRD is anticipated in operational range. This is the same table, only it includes the simulations with starting stages at Pensacola um, that include the extreme hypothetical values, so between 734 and 757 feet PD. The last row in this table is identical to what I just showed you in the previous table. There was no change there. Next, I'll get into the discussion loop results, and you'll see that I'll be going through each of the events we simulated individually to discuss what the results mean for each of those. So starting with the September 1993 event, this was the second largest event as far as releases from Pensacola Dam. Uh, remember, this model is, is dependent on the outflows from Pensacola Dam, and then also the stages that are computed at Kerr Dam through the simulation. So the peak stages at Kerr Dam for this event only differed slightly when using starting stages within GRDA's anticipated operational range but then they differed by a maximum of 4.4 feet for including starting stages that were within the extreme hypothetical range outside of GRD's anticipated range. As for differences in peak water surface elevations and inundation in the upstream portion of the model, and whenever I talk about the upstream portion of the model, I'm talking about the portion of the model that's closest to Pensacola Dam. Um, so whenever, I'll, you'll hear me reference that several times throughout this discussion of results. 
So for the upstream portion of the model, the maximum water surface elevation differences range between 1.1 to 3.4 feet when looking at starting stages within GRD's anticipated operational range. And those differences range from 6.6 .6 to 10 feet when using starting stages that included the extreme hypothetical values. There were smaller differences in max water surface elevation and inundation in the downstream portion of the model, mostly um, through Lake Hudson, with no appreciable differences in maximum inundation through Lake Hudson. For this event, the flow adjustment for Lake Hudson was not exceeded, therefore the duration of inundation was zero when you look at any of the starting stages uh, we simulated, including those with extreme hypothetical values. These plots should look somewhat familiar to what Jesse was showing previously for the UHM. It's the same story. Um, this is showing the full extent of the DHM. So on the right, you have Pensacola Dam. On the left, you have Kerr Dam. Um, you can see the rainbow of colors there representing the different max water surface elevation profiles for the various starting stages of Pensacola Dam. I'll draw your attention to the light gray and dark gray dotted lines. The light gray dotted lines, similar to what Jesse presented for the UHM, represents the difference in max water surface elevation for um, starting stages that included those extreme values from 734 to 757 feet PD, and that's plotted against the uh, secondary right axis, Y axis. And then the dark black dotted line is the same difference, only this is the simulation simulations that included um, in, within GRD's anticipated operational range. Moving on to the June 2004 event, this is the smallest as far as releases from Pensacola Dam of the events we looked at. For peak stages at Kerr Dam, the peak stages differed by 1.32 feet for, um, but for the anticipated operational range. And then peak stages differed by um, up to 13 feet for starting stages that included uh, extreme hypothetical values. As for differences in max water surface elevation, um, and inundation, they were most pronounced in the upstream portion of the DHM for this event. The max water surface elevation differences in this upstream portion range from 1.8 to 7.3 feet when looking at starting stages within GRD's anticipated operational range. And then those same differences uh, range from 14 to 20 feet for starting stages that included extreme hypothetical values outside of GRD's anticipated range. So this event, the flow of Jesus for Lake Hudson, were not exceeded, so the duration of downstream inundation was zero when looking at any of the starting stages simulated. Here's the graphical depiction of that water surface profile. Uh, you can see just graphically what I just described. Again, this is a one-year event. <clears throat> Next, we'll talk about the July 2007 event. This is the third smallest um, for releases from Pensacola Dam of the event, events we looked at. Um, for this event, the peak stages at Kerr Dam only differed slightly for starting stages within GRD's anticipated operational range and those included those that included extreme values. The differences in maximum inundation um, were not appreciable through Lake Hudson just due to the, the minor differences at Kerr Dam. The differences in max water surface elevation and inundation for this event were more pronounced in the upstream portion of the, of the model where the differences ranged from zero, about 0 0.7 to 1.9 feet for starting stages within GRD's anticipated operational range. And then they ranged from just shy of one foot to 3.8 feet for starting stages that included uh, extreme hypothetical values outside of GRD's anticipated operational range. For this event, the flow adjustments for Lake Hudson were not exceeded, so the duration of downstream inundation was zero for any of the starting stages. Here's the graphical depiction of that water surface profile. Again, this is a four-year event. You can see that the, um, the max water surface elevations are very similar to each other throughout Lake Hudson uh, with a little bit larger spread um, as you approach Pensacola Dam. Next is the October 2009 event, which is the second smallest of the events we looked at as far as releases from Pensacola Dam. For peak stages at Kerr Dam, they differed by 3.9 feet when using starting stages within GRD's anticipated operational range. And the differences were about 5.8 feet when looking at starting stages that included extreme hypothetical values outside of GRD's range. There were ne nearly uniform differences in max water surface elevations throughout the model for this event. And those differences in maximum inundation are most pronounced in the upstream portion of the model. 
for this event, the flow easement for Lake Hudson was not exceeded, so the duration of downstream inundation is at zero for any of the starting stage stages looked at. Here's a graphical depiction of that water surface profile. This is a three year event. You can see the nearly uniform differences in water surface elevation throughout the domain of the model. And lastly, for the historical events, that is, um, this December 2015 event is the third largest as far as releases from Pensacola Dam of the events we looked at. For starting stages at Pensacola Dam, it's in GRD's anticipated operational range. Releases from Pensacola Dam were nearly identical for this, this um, event. The peak stages at Kerr Dam and the differences in max water surface elevation throughout the model are also nearly identical. For starting stages at Pensacola Dam that included extreme hypothetical values, the differences in max water surface elevation and inundation were less pronounced through Lake Hudson and range from about 0.3 to 1.2 feet. When looking um, at differences in inundation in the upper portions of the model, uh, they ranged from about well, 1.5 to 9.9 feet and were most pronounced up in that upper portion as well. As for flow achievements for Lake Hudson, they were not exceeded for this event either. So the duration of downstream inundation was zero when looking at any of the starting stages. And there's the graphical depiction of this water surface profile. And then uh, last of the events, uh, we have the 100 year event, which is obviously the largest that we looked at as far as releases from Pensacola Dam. For this event, the peak releases were identical for all starting stages, and that includes the ones with extreme values outside of GRDA's proposed or anticipated range. Uh, this results in nearly identical max water surface elevations throughout the DHM for all starting stages, and therefore the maximum inundation extents are nearly identical. 100 year event is the only event that exceeded the Lake Hudson flow achievements. And these flow achievements were exceeded between River Mile 69.7 and River Mile 73.3. This is from about three miles downstream of the Oklahoma 18 bridge to about half a mile upstream of that same bridge. The maximum difference in duration of inundation is three hours within this area for um, starting stages within GRD's anticipated operational range. And that maximum difference in duration of inundation is 22 hours when you look at starting stages that included the extreme hypothetical values outside of the GRD's anticipated range. Here's the water surface profile for that. You can see that the lines are coincidence, so they're all identical. We also did the comparison of all the inflow events against each other using historical starting stages. So essentially looking at the magnitude of those events. So unsurprisingly, the releases for Pensacola Dam vary significantly between all the events that were analyzed using historical starting stages. The peak stages at Kerr Dam, when we look at all these events against each other, differed by a maximum of approximately 15 feet. The differences in max water surface elevation and maximum inundation extents um, throughout the model are um, are there, but they're most pronounced through the upper portion of the model. Um, for the, any of these events, historically using historical starting stages, the flow achievements for Lake Hudson were not exceeded. So the duration of inundation is zero. There's the plot comparing the water surface profiles for all these different magnitude events. Um, we'll start historical starting stages. The black line on this one just present, uh, presents the maximum difference between all those events compared to against each other. There is no um, gray, light gray line on this plot. I'll break there to see if there's any questions before I jump into the anticipated operational analysis. Does anyone have any questions? I don't see any hands raised. Carry on, Mike. Uh, this, should, this slide should look familiar at this point. Um, these are the uh, scenarios we ran as far as the anticipated operational analysis. As, GRD, or as Jesse had mentioned before and also Ryan, um, GRD anticipates operating Pensacola Dam with a fluctuating reservoir between 742 and 745 feet TD. In other words, they will no longer use the real curve. Uh, we looked at anticipated versus baseline operations for the suite of runs shown in this table. Those range from the smallest event being the one year event, all the way up to the 100 year event. And then also one um, in the middle of the July 2007 event that has some importance to the upstream communities. For 
each of these um, scenarios, we did look at anticipated versus baseline um, conditions. Um, for the June 2004, which is the one year and the 100 year events, we looked at both 757 starting stages at Pensacola Dam and 734 starting stage. Those are both in the extreme range. And then for the July 2007, as Ryan and Jesse covered earlier too, uh, we looked at um, comparing baseline and anticipated operations using the period of record starting stage. This slide covers the results of the anticipated operational analysis. Uh, so you can see the table at the top gives the maximum increase in peak water surface elevation. This is throughout the entire DHM due to anticipated operations when compared to baseline operations. The first row there is the June 2004 event, or a one-year event, with a starting pool elevation of 734, so a very low starting pool elevation. Um, that, that simulation showed a difference in max water surface elevation of right around a half a foot. But I do want to mention that those flows were contained within the riverbanks, and there's no spillway releases associated with that event since it is so small. Um, you can see the rest of the simulations there um, with um, comparing both baseline and anticipated operations at either 757 or 734 starting stage, or in the case of the July 2007, the period of record starting stage. Um, those are neg negligible differences, with the only real difference showing up of 0 0.01 feet for the 100 year event with the starting pool of 734. So, based on that, um, anticipated operations are said to have an immaterial impact on downstream water surface elevations when compared to baseline operations. Similar to the UHM, we did not create any additional inundation maps because the differences cannot be effectively displayed on the map. Essentially, the extent of the inundation for anticipated operations is virtually identical to the extent of inundation for baseline operations. As far as duration of inundation goes, when making this comparison between anticipated and baseline operations, we're showing um, the maximum difference in duration of inundation is only one hour when comparing baseline to anticipated operations. And this occurs only for the 100 year event when looking at a starting stage of 734 feet PD. These plots are similar to what Jesse already showed for the UHM, only for the downstream model, obviously. Um, this plot right here is for the June 2004 event comparing baseline to anticipated operations. The top blue line is the um, comparison between the anticipated and baseline operations for a 757 foot starting stage. Um, the purple line is underneath the blue line since they're essentially coincident. So baseline and anticipated um, are coincident in that case. The bottom yellow and red lines do show that slight difference of around a half a foot, again, contained within the riverbanks. Um, for the 734 foot simulations, again, comparing anticipated to baseline operations. And then you can also see the black line along the bottom um, showing the differences in the 734 um, foot simulations, which would be the dark black line and then the light gray line, which you cannot see since the difference is zero for the 757 simulations. Uh, this is a similar plot only for the July 2007 event or a four year event comparing baseline to anticipated operations. You can't see the difference between the lines because they are coincident. It's a very similar story for the 100 year event, both the 734 and 757 foot starting stages show no difference um, compared even against all, all of themselves in um, this plot. So, getting on to our conclusions, um, the DHM does show that initial stages of Pensacola Dam within GRD is anticipated range and those that, that include extreme hypothetical operational um, ranges have an influence on downstream water surface elevation and out of bank inundation. However, out of bank inundation is a result of spillway releases directed by the Corps of Engineers. So Section 7 of the 1944 Flood Control Act says that the Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for flood control operations at Pensacola Dam. We also have the Arkansas River Basin Water Control Master Manual, which prescribes how the Corps needs to operate with system balancing of flood storage throughout their 30-some uh, reservoirs within the Arkansas system. Lastly, we have the National Defense Authorization Act, fiscal year 2020, that states that the Secretary of the Army shall have exclusive jurisdiction and responsibility for management of the flood pool for flood control operations at Grand Lake of the Cherokees. But the last point I want to kind of uh, drive home here is that our anticipated operations analysis, as I just showed, 
um, has a, shows that anticipated operations have an immaterial impact compared to baseline operations. So I'm looking at the DHM. And that about covers it, so I'll open it up to make sure no one has questions. Or... Are there any questions? I don't see any questions, right. Nick. All right, we'll close out of this. And are we taking a break now, or are we? Yes, uh, um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so um, we'll just take a 15-minute break and start back up at 2.50.
Okay, we are back and we're going to start with infrastructure. So, Jesse, take the floor. All right, welcome back, everyone. As Jacqueline said, I'll be discussing the infrastructure study. We'll talk about the study objectives, the most recent FERC determination, study results, discussion of those results, and then conclusions. So, objectives. This comes directly from FERC's 2018 um, approved study plan. In consultation with the stakeholders, determine a list of infrastructure types to be included in the study, including infrastructure types that have the potential to be flooded under Army Corps of Engineers directed flood control operations and GRDA project operations. Determine a range of inflow conditions for which model results show project ops, hydropower, or core directed flood control are likely to have an effect on flooding. Provide maps and tables identifying frequency and depth of flooding for each item of infrastructure under baseline operations and for the range of inflow and condition, inflow conditions where ops may have an effect on flooding. And finally, if needed, based on the h date results, provide additional maps and tabular information for anticipated ops. So let's discuss the uh, most recent FERC determination in February 2022. Um, after the ISR, FERC recommended the following modifications that on maps and in tabular format for each affected infrastructure location, show the change in depth and frequency for the same starting elevations required in the H&H &H study, i.e. 734 feet PD through 757 feet PD. Then also include maps and tag data for the one-year and three-year inflow events. This is in addition to the 21-year, four-year, and 15-year events that were included at the ISR. And finally, on tables and maps clearly show the frequency of flooding, or i.e. return period, for each modeled inflow event. So let's look at how GRDA completed that approved study plan. Uh, again, the, or, or rather, the same starting elevations required in the H&H &H study, 734 to 757, are presented on maps and in tables for each infrastructure location. The maps and tables now present all the same inflow events um, as the historical events in the H&H &H study. That is the September 93, June 2004, July 2007, October 09, and December 2015 events. And then on tables and maps and throughout the report, just for good measure, return period for each model uh, inflow event is clearly displayed. So we'll look at our study results. Again, we looked at all the starting elevations recommended by FERC and we tabulated and mapped the results. Um, our folk, our the discussion will focus on GRDA's anticipated operational range, um, but for a starting reservoir elevation of 734 feet PD, a uh, hypothetical operational condition considered extreme and well outside of GRDA's anticipated operational range is also reviewed <coughs> to determine whether a reduction in reservoir elevation would decrease loss of infrastructure use. And um, finally, starting elevation of 757 feet PD was analyzed, and those results can be summarized as follows. As follows, if GRDA operated at 757 feet PD, a reservoir elevation that is 12 feet higher than the top of GRDA's anticipated op range, and an elevation equal to the top of the dam, infrastructure locations would be inundated by depths similar to or greater than those depths for operational levels within GRDA's anticipated operational range. Practically speaking, increasing the top of the operational range to 757 feet is simply not possible. Now let's talk a little bit about classification of difference in depth. Um, like we did at the ISR, we classify infrastructure locations with differences in depth greater than uh, 0.1 feet and divided those into three classes. Uh, there you see the classes on your screen. Those have not changed since the ISR. And infrastructure locations meeting these criteria were placed into a class based on the greatest difference in depth for the inflow events. And uh, our analysis uh, had 15 out of the 228 infrastructure locations, or 7% of the locations meeting the criteria. Here is a table of the class one differences that are included in uh, the USR. This table comes directly from the report. Some notes on those class one differences. Um, infrastructure ID 103, which is Riverview Park, was included as a class one difference in the ISR. However, with FERC required modifications to the ops model, differences in depth are now less than or equal to 0.1 feet at that location. 
and for infrastructure IDs 86 and 88. Those were not included as class one differences at the ISR, again, with the FERC required modifications to the ops model. The depth differences at those locations now exceed 0.1 feet and are thus included in the USR. For class two differences, uh, there actually are no infrastructure locations with class two differences. We did have um, Hudson Creek Bridge and Wyandotte High School that were classified as class two, the ISR. And again, with those FERC required modifications to the OM, these were reclassified as class three in the USR. So let's look at a table of class three differences. Here is the first half of the table. And then here is the second half of the table. As you can see, and as I said before, if an infrastructure location had a difference in depth for one inflow event that met the classification, it was put in that classification. So that is to be conservative. So when you see values of zero in that table, um, that does not mean that the location was misclassified. We it is the 0.5 or the 0.8 or so on that, that drives that classification. So before I move on to discussion of results, I'll pause here and ask if there are any questions on, on that introductory uh, information in the study results. I do not see any questions or hands raised. So okay, we'll good. still have one more break for questions at the end. So. Moving on to the discussion of results. Um, only selected results are presented because the results are so similar at nearly all the locations with class one, two, or three differences. The report contains those full descriptions of each locations. Um, and in the report, the inflow event that caused the largest difference in depth is discussed first, followed by discussion of difference in depth for the other inflow events. Uh, for all locations, any increased depth resulting from a different starting reservoir elevation within GRDA's operational range did not result in any additional loss of infrastructure use. And under a hypothetical extreme operational level of 734 feet PD, only two parks would experience a minor decrease in the loss of infrastructure use. We'll discuss those coming up in just a moment. So let's look at our class one example. This is Rockdale Boulevard Bridge over Tar Creek. Uh, this figure comes directly from the report where because the 21 year inflow event, also known as the September 1993 event, uh, caused the largest difference in depth of all the inflow events simulated. We display the inundation extents for that event uh, in our little figure in the report. Now, discussing that 21 year inflow event, uh, the location is inundated by 1.3 to 1.5 feet of water for starting uh, water surface elevations within GRDA's anticipated op range. And the infrastructure location is inundated regardless of starting reservoir elevation within that anticipated op range. For the four-year event, July 2007, the inundation ranges from 6.8 to 6.9 feet. And again, it's inundated regardless of that starting reservoir elevation within GRDA's anticipated op range. For the June 2004, that's the one year, October 2009, three year, and December 2015, 15 year, the structure location was not inundated regardless of starting reservoir elevation within GRD's anticipated operational range. Therefore, for all in all events, starting reservoir elevations within the anticipated operational range do not result in additional loss of infrastructure use at this location. If GRDA operated at 734 PPD, this infrastructure location would still be inundated by the same inflow events and would be inundated by depths similar to those depths for operational levels within GRDA's anticipated operational range. So in short, there's no benefit to moving down to 734. That is our class one example. In the report, you will see that uh, we've selected one of these examples because it is indicative of the rest of the results documented in the report. Now moving on to discussing the first of two class three examples. And that first example is Wolf Creek Park, known as ID 181 in our report. For the October 2009 three year inflow event, the uh, park is inundated by 0.8 to 1.6 feet of water for those starting elevations within GRDA's anticipated off range. Um, only low lying areas are unusable regardless of the starting elevation within GRDA's anticipated off range. 
The structures subject to flooding are outside of the inundation for all the study events, and the site was designed and funded by GRDA to not be impacted by inflow events. Um, continuing our discussion for the 21-year event, September 93, um, the, or the location rather is inundated by 5.5 feet, regardless of starting elevation within the off range. And uh, yeah, the, the infrastructure location is inundated regardless of that starting elevation within the off range. For the four-year event, July 2007, the inundation ranges from 5 feet to 5.5 feet, and the infrastructure location is inundated regardless of starting reservoir elevation within GRDA's anticipated operational range. Continuing on with Wolf Creek Park, for the December 2015, or 15-year event, the depths range uh, from, or I'm sorry, the difference in depth ranges from 5.5 to 5.6 feet, and again, the infrastructure location is inundated regardless of starting reservoir elevation within GRDA's anticipated operational range. And for June 2004, aka the one-year event, the location is not uh, inundated. Continuing on still, for all the events, starting reservoir elevations within the anticipated operational range do not result in any additional loss of infrastructure use at this location. If GRDA operated at 734 feet, this infrastructure location would still be inundated by the same inflow events and would be inundated by depths similar to those depths for operational levels within GRDA's anticipated operational range, except for the October 2009 inflow event for which no inundation would occur. Because the site was designed and funded by GRDA to not be impacted by inflow events, only the low-lying areas near Grand Lake are inundated. Reducing the operational range, to 734 feet PD would still result in the same impact to infrastructure use at this location. Next, I will discuss uh, another class three example, Grove Springs Park, ID 185. For the three year event, depth, differences in depth range from, I'm sorry, inundated by 0.8 to 1.6 feet of water. Um, most of the park will be unusable regardless of starting reservoir elevation within the anticipated op range. And the park does not contain structures that can be damaged if exposed to periodic flooding. For the 21 year event, or the 93 event, it's inundated by 5.5 feet of water um, for all starting elevations within the op range and the structure is inundated regardless of that starting elevation. For the July 2007 or four year inflow event, it's 5.0 to 5.5 feet of water and again, the infrastructure location is inundated regardless of starting reservoir elevation within GRDS anticipated outrange. December 2015, the depth is 5.5 to 5.6, and it's inundated regardless. And June 2004, the one year, the location is not inundated regardless of starting reservoir elevation within the anticipated outrange. So for all events, starting reservoir elevations within the anticipated operational range do not result in additional loss of infrastructure used at this location. If GRDA operated at 734 feet, this infrastructure location would still be inundated by the same inflow events and would be inundated by depths similar to those depths for operational levels within GRDA's anticipated operational range, except for the October 2009 three-year inflow event for which no inundation would occur. Move on to conclusions. So only 7% of the infrastructure locations experienced an appreciable increase in maximum inundation depth for different starting reservoir elevations within GRDA's anticipated op range of 742 to 745. All appreciable increases in maximum inundation depth occur during high flow conditions when the Army Corps of Engineers controls the flood control operations under federal law, except for the time when the maximum inundation depth is solely a function of inflow event arrival time and not reservoir elevation, meaning that the time of maximum depth at the infrastructure location is completely independent of reservoir operation. Therefore, infrastructure locations are not adversely affected by GRDA's anticipated operations. Except for two parks, a reduction in reservoir operational elevation to 734 feet PD would not decrease the loss of infrastructure use for any of the inflow events studied. Wolf Creek Park was designed and partially funded by GRDA to avoid being impacted by inflow events. Only low-lying portion of the park 
near Grand Lake would experience a difference in inundation for the October 2009 or three year inflow event. Therefore, any potential adverse impacts have already been mitigated by GRDA during their assistance in the design and funding of the improvements to the park. And then at Grove Springs Park, low lying portions of the park would experience a difference in inundation for that three year inflow event, decreasing the low end of the anticipated operational range from 742 to 743, a difference of eight feet in operational level would only change infrastructure adverse impacts slightly at Grove Springs Park. If GRDA operated at 757 feet PD, a reservoir elevation that's 12 feet higher than the top of GRDA's anticipated operational range and an elevation equal to the top of the dam, infrastructure locations would be inundated by depths similar to or greater than those depths for operational levels within GRDA's anticipated operational range. Practically speaking, increasing the top of the operational range to 757 feet PD is not simply possible. In summary, infrastructure locations are not adversely affected by GRDA's baseline or anticipated operations of the project, which consist of reservoir levels within an operational range of 742 feet PD to 745 feet PD. Under, even under the hypothetical and extreme operational level of 734 feet PD, only two parks would experience a minor decrease in the loss of infrastructure use. And with that, we'll, uh, I'll ask for questions before wrapping up. Yes, we have a hand raised, uh, Dr. Thomas. Yeah, hi, I just have a couple of quick questions. How many infrastructure points are there in total? There's 228 points studied. 228? And how many, and I was just looking at on the report at figure, figure three, which shows uh, the South 640 bridge and you assigned elevations, you assigned a, not sure what you call it, you assigned an elevation to that, to that piece of infrastructure. Um, how, what, what's your, how did you assign all the elevations to these structures? Was it based on the design drawings or in some places the park you might have taken a representative elevation? Is that correct? What was the very last part of that? Uh, how did you assign the elevations to each point? Okay, sorry, I thought there was something after that. So these, these uh, points, I'll say to start with, the point locations have not changed since the ISR, and uh, we received no comments on the point locations or the elevations of the points at all at the ISR. So I would technically consider this uh, kind of a closed issue that um, is not up for under discussion at the USR, uh, but I will say that this is a, a publicly available, or we are relying on publicly available data sets. Um, and we are not, um, I, I guess publicly available data, I guess is a short answer. Public, so, oh, okay, I was just looking for a short. So at a park, would you have just taken a representative elevation based off the digital terrain model or from the HECRAS model, is that correct? Yes, for, for the parks, uh, you know, the infrastructure point location, we're, we're using our digital elevation data. It's the same surface we are using for the h, &H model. Okay, and so, and back to a piece of infrastructure like a bridge, what would the elevation be? Would it be something like the top cord or the surface? Where would that fall on a bridge? That would be the location at which the bridge is not going to be accessible. So it would not necessarily be um, the highest point of the bridge. So would it be a point where you cannot cross the bridge due to flooding? Is that what you're saying? That is correct, yes. Okay, okay. And say for a hospital, what would that be? Would it be the ground outside the hospital or what would that be? Um, do you have a specific location in mind? No, I'm just trying to get a general idea of what's going on. Okay, sure. Uh, that yeah, that would be the the ground outside. It's you know w where the infrastructure location uh, is or or is not accessible. Okay, and and of the 228 points, how many of them are located within the easement or with, outside of the easement? I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay, have you calculated that? Um, 
I I don't think I have. I can't think of it. Okay, I don't have any more questions. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Jesse related to infrastructure? Okay. I think that is the end of it, Jesse. Yep. Thank you. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, we'll go ahead and close up and wrap up for the day. Uh, yes, for tomorrow. All right, sorry about the little technical glitch there. Uh, so really, I want to thank everybody today as we close up. Um, two things really come to mind is it's really clear that we're all very interested in what happens uh, throughout the system. And um, lots of dialogue today. Some of it got a little heated. Some of it was pretty passionate. But from my perspective, it just really shows that how heavily invested we are in getting to the right answer here. It's also clear that we're not going to see eye to eye. And so there's been a lot of collaboration, a lot of data collection, and um, all we can do is follow the science. And that's what we have tried to do today. But as always, you know, we've asked about comments today. We would like you to continue to send your comments in uh, specifically <coughs> before the November 29th deadline. And uh, and I thank everybody for the time, and we will start at 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay. That is it for today, so we will start back up at 9 o'clock in the morning. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>